There's no place to escape to. This is the last time. Oh, yes. On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. This one goes out for my grandfather. Oh. <laughs> so you pop up. I'm not proud of you. All right, well, hey, you hey, know what? Hey, you know everything you do is kind of gay to me. I don't mind it because, <laughs> hey, you're finally What's talking about What's a podcast? About. I disapprove of ever made the decision you've made in your life. Hey, you know, Henry, are you Rush Limbaugh? I wish we <laughs> used the atom bomb on America. <laughs> Welcome to the last podcast on the left, everyone. Ben, hanging out with Henry and Marcus. Today's episode episodes uh, mm-hmm. to come are going to be historic, exceptionally violent, and dare I say, USA, USA, Wait. USA. You are wait. daring there. That's a big dare. <laughs> that is a big dare that I think you might lose. You got to wait. damn it. You got to <laughs> wait. Um, first of all, the Manhattan Project, is that the red or the white? Whoa, all That's right, just... we are on to the Manhattan. Clam we... chowder. Yep. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. We are covering the Manhattan project. I feel like we need more fanfare because this is going to be big. I got to remember, this is our it's our basic cable episode right here. Right here, right up top. <laughs> this is old school at your Nana's house. Oh, yeah. Mm. History channel viewing. We're dead in the center of it. We're going to say come a lot more oh, nice. than you, you normally they <laughs> yeah. would on the history Henry channel. Thomas, yeah. Henry Thomas, Henry Thomas, your grandmother, they told me if you eat Skittles, you're gay. Die. That's what, you, that's Die. what my husband said. Stay in hell. Father said. Stay in hell. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what this series is, is that this is something that I personally have been wanting to do for fucking years been talking about doing this but what 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 took so long it's just the manhattan project (laughs) well we kind of put it into full gear because of the fucking oppenheimer movie that's coming out this june but what i'm hoping truly is that what we talk about in this series is going to take a massive shit (laughs) <laughs> on whatever the Oppenheimer movie has to say. I'm sure it's going to be a great film. I'm sure. Yeah. Love Christopher Nolan. We're not remotely associated with them. I matter no. of fact, if you, I feel like people are immediately are like, oh, they got an Oppenheimer tie-in. I am certain they want to distance themselves <laughs> of course. from our content. We do not We do not speak for Christopher Nolan. No, we don't. And I know Oppenheimer, ooh, something bad happens. It still sounds like someone who needs a swirly, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> and I'm also going to say is how Having Matt Damon play General Leslie Groves so funny. is the dumbest shit I've ever heard wow. in my fucking life. Leslie Groves is he has the body of Foghorn Leghorn. <laughs> Like, he should not be played by Hollywood famous handsome person, yeah. Matt Damon. He's a porky pig with a howitzer. If they do what they did with Charlie Theron's face when she played Eileen Warnell's to Matt Damon's butt and legs to no. make him look like a dumpy no, weevil never, one, no, no, no. then he will win an Oscar. They're, they're yeah. going to give him a fucking mustache and then put an end to it. They should give him a butt Oscar, a Oscar. <laughs> All right, everyone, the Manhattan Project, episode one. I'm the, more of a Queens person. Mm. The Manhattan Project was America's collective effort to create the world's first atomic bomb. Yay! Now, while it is one of the most impressive achievements in mankind's history, (laughs) the greatness of the Manhattan Project is not just in how it was developed, built, tested, and dropped. Mm -mm. Rather, the bomb is also objectively impressive because the aftermath of that first atomic explosion on Hiroshima created quite possibly the most concentrated period of misery, suffering, and horror in human history. Is that wow. good? I thought that was uh, Woodstock 99. You, you know, <laughs> it's actually, that's just under. Just, I mean, this was, I mean, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the dropping of the atomic bomb, it was the perfect cherry on top to the deadliest conflict in human history, World War II. You guys don't watch all of your World War II documentaries with Limp Bizkit uh, playing in the background and watch him on mute? Oh, yeah. I mean, honestly, as you could see, Oppenheimer in the end, he did do it all for the nothing. He did, and did, he did break stuff indeed. He did. Didn't he too. really did. Yeah. Our goal on this series is because we are three, as y'all know, we bleed red blood, red, red blue, white. Well, right? You're talking to a man here who's my roots go back before the Revolutionary War. We didn't come over on the yeah. Mayflower because the Mayflower was a bunch of fucking pussies. Wow, we came over wow. with the fucking 
criminals like the rest of America did mm. to fucking trap wolves and shoot shit up See, and my, fighting the Revolutionary my, War. My, my We've been here since fucking here. 1600s, motherfucker. My grandparents didn't land in Staten Island to the 1940s, so I'm innocent. Well, <laughs> um, my but, father got here in the 70s. Uh, yeah, I know, sort of reverse way. And also, first of all, we're going to say, number one, we're going to say some maybe unfair things about Kissel's lineage yes. during this entire period. And I, I'm oh, just you a, pretend like people didn't mind the most intelligent people from Nazi Germany. Let's just, <laughs> bl let's just do a blanket to Kissel. You're just going to have to take it. I I, what, I, I, it's not me. And number two, our goal is because we are so American centric, we have been trying to figure out a way to kind of break out oh, yeah. of the mindset of the American narrative about the atomic bomb. Because again, yeah, was it big? Oh yeah. yeah. Was it messy? You better believe it because yeah. it's what we do best. Yeah. But uh, it was not like cool. Well, <laughs> did it need People to happen? Were mad. People were super mad. Did it need to happen? We shall discuss. Well, in terms of lives taken, only the Nazis beat the concentrated death toll at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They had a little thing called Operation Reinhardt. Mm. With that undertaking, approximately 1.47 million Jews were killed in death camps in just 100 days. That amounts to 25% of the entire Jewish death toll in all of World War II. But as we'll see, it was the justified fear of a Nazi victory that those people would win. It wasn't the threat of the Japanese. It was the Nazis that led the Allies to believe that the development of the atomic bomb was not only urgent, but morally necessary. It's, can we actually, for this episode, yeah. can we go back to calling them the old-fashioned Nazis? <laughs> Nazi. Nazi. I mean, Goddamn Nazi. Nazis. Yeah, it's Nazi works out. I'll put a fucking couple of Nazis in there. But, yeah, man. You know. you know, yeah, pile them up. <laughs> it's sort of an interesting thing. It's kind of like parallel parking. It's not so difficult to get in, but getting out is hard. <laughs> that's and what they that say about war. to be with war. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the American myth has always been that we dropped the bomb on Japan to save the lives of a million American troops who would have been killed during the invasion of the Japanese mainland. We were all being told mm -hmm. that every man, woman, and child were being trained to fight to the death for every blade of grass. Hey, you gotta be, you, you wouldn't even believe what the Shiba Inus were trained to do. <laughs> also, it's like such a horrible thing because that's completely true. One foot of land costs like one human life and it'd be like, you can have the soil. What the <laughs> fuck? My life is worth one blade of grass to the United States government? Pocahontas was wrong. Oh, no. Well, it was more the opposite. It was more that my life is worth a blade of grass to the Japanese government. Yes. That's what the Japanese, that's what many of the Japanese were thinking. Because the, the concept that every Japanese person was going to fight for every inch was propaganda of the highest order. It was a half truth. There were certainly children being trained to kill American soldiers, women being trained, old men yeah. being trained. But most of them were like, hey, we'd love to eat more. Yeah. Uh, by yeah. the end of 1945, a lot of them were like, hey, how long is this going? I'm looking at my watch here. Oh, it's glowing. That's incredible. Who did this? Yeah. But we could wrap it up. Yeah. I mean, there were multiple avenues to peace with Japan. Avenues both bloodless and aggressive. Yeah, we could have gotten it all. We yeah. could have done all of it. But at no point was a full ground invasion of Japan even a good option. No. Much less the only one that lay before us at the end of the war. And the sad Because the war thing is, was fucking over. The sad thing is, and I know I'm supposed to bring levity, but I'll bring a little truth to it. Wow. The children were so young during this war, they actually called it Operation Teletubby. <laughs> and I thought that that was ridiculous. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I said, it's ridiculous. ridiculous. I, I, that is ridiculous. ridiculous. Also, just, I'm going to also, again, and blanket. Remember, a lot of opinions are going to get thrown around in yeah. our show, right? So we, we're going to talk about this uh, in our opinionated way, but it's also trying to break out of an American centered view of history. Sure. But, you know, but we're going to, you know, we'll get into some details. Yeah, we're absolutely. Details. Yeah. Well, definitely, we're going to break out of the Amerocentric ideas, of course, but at the end of the day, we still fucking did it. My I mean, thing is, is like my other side of it. It's like, yeah, we're mad now, right? Mad at America. Ooh, mad. Sure, ooh, uh. but did you want them to get it? <laughs> did you want the Nazis to get it? No, you did didn't you, want them to get did it. Did you want it? No. Is that what you fucking wanted? They did not want them to get it. This is human nature at its we're worst. We're just generous. <laughs> all right. But really, that's what the story we're going to tell over the next five episodes is going to be all about. We're going to cover why. The atomic bomb went into development in the first place. We're going to cover how America pulled off such a massive undertaking and how the allies engaged in the ultimately unnecessary task of keeping the Nazis 
from getting the atomic bomb too. And at the end, I promise you that we will fully cover over the course of two episodes Mm. the unimaginable, almost unspeakable horror. Almost unspeakable horror. Almost because we can't, we got to talk about it. We're going to speak about it. It's audio medium. Right. The horror that resulted as a result of our decision to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's some of the worst shit I've ever read it, in my life. It's wow. pretty fucking bad. And so that's why for those of you who are like, oh, I wish you guys were doing another Chicago Rippers series. I don't it's think anyone like, asked for that. No, that's all that they <laughs> yeah. want. I mean, like, listen, pretty, don't pretty worry. Well on nipple cutting. Right now, we're just going to do a bunch of radiation poisoning and 1940s hijinks, but we're going to get to 200,000 dead. Yeah. So don't worry, wow. it's coming. Oh. Yeah. All right. What'd you say to me the other day? You're going to get real tired of hearing the word sloughing. Oh, yeah. You're going to be real mad at that yeah. word. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Now, in just three years, at the cost of $2 billion, America created an infrastructure that was as large as the entire automobile industry of the United States at the time to research the necessary methods to build and deliver an atomic bomb to a foreign enemy. It's the superpower of unfettered capitalism. It does show you how times have changed. $2 billion is like a hammer and a screwdriver now for the Pentagon. This isn't that expensive. No, that's $2 billion in 1941 money. Right. But that's it's, get, that's going to be hundreds of billions of dollars. It's a lot of money. I don't know the math on that. <laughs> I don't know the math on that. I mean, and it's also, not like, you know, the trillion dollars we spent on the Iraq war, but it's right. still pretty impressive. It's, it's good. pretty impressive. It's, it's good. good. It's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, this effort included multiple locations in three different regions of America. We built cities to get, to get this shit done. We built cities in months to get this shit done. Hmm. And it involved thousands of people. And most of these people had no idea idea what they were actually working towards. What I like about this series is that like it's sort of like if you looked at Mordor in Lord of the Rings and you were like, <laughs> man, it took a hell of an architect to put all this together. Like it yeah. really is like just looking at that giant factory of violence and just being like, holy shit, they all showed up to work on time. How did you get <laughs> orcs to all arrive for their shifts? We uh. just simply don't know about the orcs, nor do we know about their sex life. How do they procreate? Why well, do they well, procreate? Some of them are Can built they? Can't and, they and they're not? grown. Well, that's the Urukai. That's the Urukai. Yeah, right. but the Urukai, yeah, they're former. Orcs, or- fuck. There's women orcs. There's a lot of debate on that, <laughs> but we're not here to debate that today. But the dark shadow of that impressive feat is that since the Manhattan Project was such a massive undertaking engaged entirely in secret, it gives conspiracy theorists fuel to justify the feasibility of the most Byzantine conspiracy hmm. theories. See, most of the big conspiracies, like just say, for example, 9-11 was an inside job. Okay. They fall apart. When you start looking logically at the massive infrastructure needed to pull off such an operation without anyone knowing anything about it before, during, or after. But if you make that argument, conspiracy theorists can always say, hey, if America can keep the Manhattan Project a secret, then they can keep anything a secret. Sure. Mm. And then, of course, when it comes to lies by omission or allowing things to go undetected, I mean, 9-11 has a lot of loose threads where you're like, how did that occur? Because, you know, the idea of stupidity, perhaps. I think we're going to see a little bit of that here, too, because. But what you're talking about is inaction. I'm talking about full action. action. And the thing is. We didn't keep the Manhattan Project a secret. Oh, no. We no, it was kind of an... <laughs> it, it, the, the way we did it was a secret, but a whole fucking world. I mean, the people we were all at war with were all racing to do the same exact thing yeah. at the same exact time. Yeah, everybody knew we were working in an, on yeah. an atomic bomb. I mean, it wasn't front page news, but even the most innermost circle of scientists developing the bomb, they had spies feeding secrets to the Soviets, there was this dude, Fuchs, that put the Soviets like two years ahead of where they would have been without us. And there were other people, like there were dudes like Richard Feynman, who would like pull pranks on security. Like he and would just roll them like, hey, guy, yeah. what you working on? What's, <laughs> a, what's that above him? Like sticking his finger in like yeah. he's Guy Fieri yeah. visiting another set in the Food Network Channel's hey, fucking <laughs> studio center. Hey, man, I have massive PTSD from World War One. Could you please stop playing pranks on me like that? <laughs> no <laughs> He'd like sneak in and out of classified areas just to see if he could. And he knew they couldn't shoot him. 
Right. But, but yeah, they, we didn't keep it a secret. This shit was Swiss cheese. And perhaps even more germane to the conversation is the fact that as soon as we dropped the bomb, the president went on TV and said, surprise, <laughs> it's called an atomic bomb, you fucking morons. Yeah. Wow. They're in America. Welcome. We do awesome shit. And here's how we did it. Look at how much it took for us to fucking do this. Can you do it? I don't think so. Yeah. Be afraid, motherfuckers. And you could subtitle that with literally like, now who's the small man now? Yeah. <laughs> I tell you what, my name's Harry Truman. Harry is my Harry. You said it is the hairless Truman. <laughs> but the point is, is that yeah, we did keep it mostly a secret for a couple years. Sure. But we immediately told everybody what we did. We didn't keep the Manhattan Project a secret forever. Well, the the bomb explosion itself blew the cover. Yeah, oh, literally. The cover like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that where you see the hints of 9-11 in this is actually on the other side. Like, when we get into the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we will talk about the fact that they did have some vague warning that some mysterious plane was showing up that wasn't acting like any... They, That's they, what I was told, that they did have warning to move, but I'm not sure. They had an opportunity to knock it out of the sky, and then they didn't. So we'll see. It's like that same thing where... It's weird. Like, well, yeah. how 9-11 might have been allowed to happen could have been done by a small group of people that had some idea of a, like, long view for the United States of America. The Manhattan Project, it's it's very difficult to get that many people all pulling in the same direction without it being a sort of, like, positive, pro-nationalistic thing. Not everybody's going to be fighting for the Ameri for a country to fail. <laughs> yes, there is. And that's the thing, is that those conspiracy theories are... Active conspiracy theories. Henry, what you're talking about, those are passive conspiracy theories. Well, we're going to make Marcus work today. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and active conspiracy theories take massive amounts of, of infrastructure. It's cooperation. Yeah. Yes, it's cooperation. And that sort of thing cannot be kept a fucking secret. And mm -hmm. really, at the end of the day, keeping it a secret completely misses the point of doing something like this. Right. Because when you tell everybody, look, this is what we did and this is how we did it. It tells them we can do this to you again. And it also tells them we have the power and resources to do this over and over and over again. And if we can do this, mm -hmm. imagine what the fuck else we're capable of. Absolutely. And, and we're without... still the only people to use it in war. And yeah. it's the and we that's also we'll get into the the mentality of why we dropped it because of that. Mm -hmm. It's more kind of showing, cool. hey, not only we build this big stick. We're going to whap you with it, too. Yeah, and, really? it also, and it's also not only we'll build this big stick and we'll whap it with you, too, but it's also going to Congress and saying, like, hey, thanks for giving us all that money to build this big stick. Yeah, we'll use it. Well, Congress is like, well, no problem. Thank you for the kickback. <laughs> we do appreciate that. But I, I think one question that I, I would posit is human nature. Was it just bound to be used? Uh, we didn't use it. Any, but, but honestly, any philosophical question. Honestly, yeah. that will actually be one of the central yeah. questions of specifically this first episode. Okay. You know, and in in the future, you know, it's uh, Henry does have some interesting ideas about that that we were talking about earlier. Um, All but I need is one it. atomic bomb. <laughs> if I just had one, one just I one. could change <laughs> so much. You could. <laughs> I could change. Yeah. Now, as far as sources go, we've got a bevy that our research team has done an incredible job with. We've used like five books for this series. And we'll put that full list on our Instagram. But for this episode in particular, we used quite a bit from a fucking fantastic book called The Bastard Brigade. The Bastard by Brigade. <laughs> awesome name. <laughs> great name. Yeah, by Sam Keen. It's written from the perspective of the Allies versus the Nazis in respect to the development of the atomic bomb. And of course, the Bastard Brigade, they were brought together when the general said, all right, who um, amongst you have not had a father? Who funny, has no father? Funny. funny. And then they funny. said, I don't funny. have a dad. So and you're willing to die for the country. Uncle Sam's your father. Come over here. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. He starts fingering you under the table. Well, as such, this first episode is going to have a whole lot of Nazis because had we not been so Nazis, <laughs> now have, because had we not been so afraid that the Nazis were going to make a nuclear weapon happen, it's almost positive that we ourselves would not have put the Manhattan Project into motion. And it turns out all those facilities were just cooking up more meth for the troops and Hitler. A lot of it's meth. <laughs> and a lot of it's, it's meth. a lot of it's drug. There's a lot of drug mm. building and it's a lot of like. I, I, you know, they love rockets. They had yeah. fun. They loved rockets. And so let's start with the people who discovered the scientific and mechanical principles that made the mass slaughter of up to 226,000 people possible. 
See, kids, science can be fun. You see? <laughs> it can be. It's almost, it's a quarter million people. <laughs> That's I mean, fun. Wow. <laughs> see, and, Stan, science is cool. And not all of them died immediately. See, they suffered, Stan. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> now, we're not going to get too into the weeds with the science of the atomic bomb, because after all, this is still a room full of liberal arts majors who have avoided science and math at all costs for our entire lives. I yes. will say some of the more challenging reading I've done <laughs> was some of trying to d understand how all of these things work. Yeah. I'm still mad about the uh, when they added the fucking letters. I'm still I mad. Yeah. <laughs> and I literally... The letters, I, are you talking about chemistry? Yeah, I'm yeah. still mad. I was like, I thought this was numbers. No, no, you're not about and, oh, you're talking about algebra. I'm, I'm you're talking, not I'm even joking. they added the letters. It's <laughs> completely real. Because like, Very upset. I algebra. Go, I'm good with letters. But then I was looking at the letters because all chemistry is I don't, is I, using letters like they're numbers. I hate <laughs> and it. And I was like, what in the living fuck? And then they tried to like, they no, just A dance is around. three. I was like, well, then put three. I don't You're talking I, about algebra. I Henry's hate talking it. about chemistry. I look at it and you know, it all is dumb. You guys can't even have a conversation about science talking about the same branch of science. I don't know what science this is. <laughs> I know. It's physics. It's nuclear there we go. physics. Okay. My <laughs> level of science is still like, what if I mix like garlic butter with peanut butter? Does it make a baby? <laughs> If you put it in a woman, we don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what we're we're going to do our best to not gloss over it too much, because while the science is indeed complicated, it's fucking nuclear physics. Yeah. Explaining some of it gives context to the people who discovered it. Important, essential context. And it tells us the motivations for why certain people did what they did and why some of those same people didn't do things that they should have. Mm. Oh, wow. Sounding judgy. <laughs> a little. That's the one thing about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When you are not in favor of it, you do sound a little prudish. Yeah, you're like, okay, <laughs> Mr. Beatnik. I'm actually talking about the Nazis. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. They <laughs> really <laughs> dropped the ball. Yeah. Honestly. They did the, drop the, the ball. The Nazis okay, well, fucking bumbled this whole fucking well, shit. Well, that's what we're going to get into. And furthermore, the science also gives us insight into just how horrible of a weapon an atomic bomb really is. Because we knew full well the consequences of setting off a nuclear explosion in a city long before we actually did it. We knew mm. exactly what would happen. Yeah. Rise from your grave. Now, put simply, America began developing an atomic weapon for one reason and one reason only, which was both understandable and necessary at the time. Namely, all of our intelligence and all of our best scientists were screaming that the Nazis were developing an atomic bomb themselves. And if the Nazis were to succeed, and we had every reason to think they would, then it was goodbye London, followed soon after by a fond farewell to Washington, D.C., and then New York, and then Baltimore? Oh, not Baltimore! <laughs> no, no, Baltimore! I gotta go to Baltimore now! <laughs> okay, Baltimore probably would have taken out, been taken out with Washington, D.C. It might have been Milwaukee. I think oh, yeah. Baltimore's gonna be, <laughs> taken <laughs> bad, I think it's gonna be taken out with bad liberal policies. Interesting. <laughs> but it's, did you know that, that MSG, Madison Square Garden, and that big old Nazi event? I feel yeah. like it would have just taken a couple of years, just judging by well, a modern American society, I think it would have just taken a couple of years for the Nazis, if they did win, to be like, U.S. states of well, oh yeah, I, mean, I, I, well, I don't know. The, I feel that's like the I'm whole, Char that's the whole Charles Lindbergh thing. I mean, Charles Lindbergh was almost elected president, and he was a Nazi. You also he was a literally straight up Nazi. Just said what Heisenberg said. <laughs> where Werner Heisenberg literally said, if we just give the Nazis a chance in a couple of years, they'll cool out. Like, literally, <laughs> like, that was the uh, idea. Be like, no, 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 they'll cool out. They'll figure it out. Yeah, they're treating they them like... They can't be mad all the time. They're treating them like a fucking toddler who's, like, fucking destroying your kitchen. Yes. Like, just right. let them tire out and eventually you'll fall asleep on the floor. It's still yeah. a fringe idea here as well. We just, they give a lot of air because they make a lot of noise. Mm. But to understand why we knew that a Nazi atomic bomb was basically the end of free society the world over, the Wolfenstein scenario, if you will. Game. Then we get to do it. Yeah. That game was so freaking, all three of those games are awesome. Yeah. We've got to understand how the world knew, how scientists knew just how powerful an atomic bomb could be. And for that, we need to go back to a little element called radium. 
Yay, yes. <laughs> hey, okay. kids, are you ready to learn about radium? I better be. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, Shu, you want to go get stoned in the bathroom uh, yeah, really quick? Yeah, yeah, don't worry. I, I got a bunch of hand sanitizer so we can chuck. <laughs> Sweet, perfect. <laughs> radium! Fucking, Mr. Parks <laughs> is fucking boring. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Parks, teach me about your funny little metals. <laughs> radium, the element that we all owe the future to. No, he's doing his old-timey voice trying to keep us things interested. <laughs> uh. Radium. Discovered by Marie and Pierre Curie in 1898, is the most radioactive naturally occurring substance in existence, and it opened the door to radioactivity research. See, in the early 20th century, radium was thought to be a sort of miracle element. It was used in everything from medicines to the minute and hour hands on glow-in-the-dark watches oh. that were being manufactured for World War I soldiers. Yeah, so they could be constantly bombarded by radioactive material at all times. Ah, it's, it's a big price but, to pay to, just to know what time it is. Well, from what it seemed like at first, radium was saving lives even in the smallest of applications. Because they just took a rock out that literally glowed. Yeah, that's and they what, were like, It's a rock that glowed, and they're like, crazy. ooh, nice. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I mean, all the glow-in-the-dark watches, you know, all these soldiers have them, they can tell the time without having to, you know, light a match sure. that would have got their head blown off by a fucking sniper. Do you okay. remember that in uh, Band of Brothers when he was like, the thing is unlucky for you to light three cigarettes off of one match. Yep. Because yep. that's how long it takes for a sniper to see you. Also, mm -hmm. there's a new series. That's why I don't do it. There's a new series coming out after 600 Pound Life called Lap Band of Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> keep it coming, Jesse. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. That's right here. Keep it coming. That's right here. <laughs> but these radium watches came with a price. See, the women working at the factories manufacturing these watches would paint the radium onto the watch hands <laughs> with little paintbrushes. Okay. And with the painting of each hand, oh no, my oh. brush, it's gotten a little swishy there. I'm not going to be able to paint these little hands. Lick, lick. Oh no. And no. then they go back to another radium. They'd go back into the radium, lick, lick, back into the radium, lick, lick, all day, all day, all day, eight hours a day. And as a result, a number of these women developed sores, anemia, mouth cancers, and a horrifying condition called radium jaw, ah. in which your jaw just fucking falls off. Yeah, oh, Roger no. Ebert. Oh, yeah. That's it makes a whole army of Roger Eberts. <laughs> That's not yeah. good. And it's bad for the movie industry. Everything's a thumbs down. Yeah, and they're <laughs> eating they're eating tongue sandwiches, and it's not from cats. <laughs> but that's worst case scenario. Best case scenario in radium jaw is that you just get like extra jaw. Ooh, like, jaw plus. Yeah, jaw. <laughs> <laughs> you like a grapefruit-sized tumor Ooh, God. on your jaw. God, that's got to be bad. And just like, oh, yeah. God. And you don't even want to be near them if they're all learning how to whistle. <laughs> <laughs> Great for blowing out a birthday cake, though. Oh, God. Don't want to see them with a taco. <laughs> no, you don't. Ooh, God. My Get God. me out of this lunch. <laughs> Very good. Very good. I, it's been long. It's been a long time ago. I'm allowed to make I'm allowed to make fun of the radium girl. Oh, you are. You are. Well, eventually a hundred workers died from radium poisoning in those watch factories. Ugh. Enough where the women who worked there were nicknamed the living dead. Jesus Christ. This is just and this is normal. Yeah, this just, is normal. It's like this industrial work It's yeah. like, oh, those are the living dead. Look at them. They're about to drop at any second, but you wouldn't know it. I hope we're not having Salisbury steak. <laughs> well, the living dead, those are the people who didn't have radium jaw. Those are the okay. women whose insides were just fucking cooked. Ugh. You know, because that's the way radiation sickness works. Is That was the, one of the big mysteries after Hiroshima and Nagasaki is that there would be the survivors that would be like, Don't spoil it, Kevin. <laughs> Don't spoil it. Uh, all right, all right. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. But I won't spoil it. I won't spoil about how... Yeah, people died of radiation poisoning after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Hey, I don't want to give away that fucking crucial plot point. And it gets superpowered. They could have gotten superpowers. It's more about like how we showed up saying, hey guys, don't worry, we'll fix it. And then we just watch people melt. <laughs> That's one way to do it. Yes. <sighs> but even with the bad press concerning what came to be known as the case of the radium girls, business interests artfully dodged the dangers of radium radiation, and they continued contributing to America's obsession with better living through chemistry. Cool. Okay. We trusted radium. We trusted atomic power. Yeah, because the scientists said it was okay. Yep. And we didn't know how it glowed. We just figured that was at God's little poops. Well, to be fair, yes, it's God's little poop. 
Yeah. Radium is it's still weird. used in some medical treatments today, although they mostly phased it out of cancer treatments by like 2015. Is that the same material that they inject into you to see? Because I know that they do sometimes inject a light radioactive material in you to chart so. through your just blood. A dye that it's they a use dye. Now. Yeah, it's not radio. No, they definitely don't inject radium into you. Absolutely not. Oh man, I, mean, I, I inject to- radium into you. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm loving it now. Well, not yeah. for what you're saying. I mean, for yeah, for the because I had that done not too long ago, and it definitely. That wasn't radium. They would have told me if it was radium, right? Honestly, it's yeah, incredible. They would have told you it was radium. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. They're always completely transparent. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of doctors work out of their cardboard box. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, once I started my treatments, it was incredible yeah. because now I don't need the nightlight at night. Yeah. <laughs> just walk through, glowing everywhere, scare my neighbors. Yeah. Well, in 2015, radium, while it was used up till 2015, it was used with far more care than the original methods. Originally... Oh, yeah. Not radium- sucking it off a fucking paintbrush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. A bunch of people making watches. No, yeah. dude, I'm talking about when they were using radium for cancer treatment. Oh, Because oh, they used radium for cancer treatment up until about 2015, and they still use it every once in a while to this day. But back then, mm. in the original times, they just cut you open, Good. took a piece of radium, Popped it on the tumor and <laughs> sewed it on uh, and then just left it there. Nah, they, I don't think that's so, man. Yeah. Or, Too simple. Yeah. It's just a nice day to be a doctor. <laughs> it was easier yeah. then. Yeah. 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 Or they'd take a radium needle and they'd just stab it. Yeah. Just pap it, pap it, pap it. They just stab it. They'd lance great. the tumor. All God, right. They'd lance a boil. Just, Nurse Nancy, what we're going to work on today is skipping the radium into the body. So you want to get two skips right by the heart. It's an idea. green idea. Well, if we cut the hole open, right, we cut them open. Spray him up, eh? Right? We put him over there about 10 15 feet. Yes, yes. And you give me a ball of radium. Yes, yes. Free throw line. Free throw line, yes, <laughs> yes. Free throw line and go. Oh, and it's a swish into his liver. It's a swish, although basketball wasn't invented, I don't believe yet. I think James Naismith had put up that pear basket. For I one. miss white basketball. <laughs> yes. When the men didn't jump and they were allowed to dribble without interference. Bob Cousy. <laughs> but of course, the most famous death associated with radium is Marie Curie herself. You know Marie Curie? Yeah, I fucking know. Polish. <laughs> You got one. <laughs> yeah, and she died of melting to death. Well, no, that actually is a bit of a misnomer. She died of aplastic anemia in 1934, but she was also fucking 66. She, for a woman that, like, free-balled radioactive material for a couple decades, that's a long life. It's a yeah. very long life. Okay. But to this day, her notebooks and papers are kept in lead-lined boxes and handled with protective clothing because they're still highly radioactive almost 100 years later. Even her fucking cookbooks, just the shit that she used in her house, will give you cancer. You don't want all of your books to be stored next to the Necronomicon for safety reasons. No, but it is a bit of a myth that she died from radium exposure. She's famous for dying from radium exposure, but she didn't actually die from that. What What, did her help? She's not like, she wasn't like she was fucking on this cover of sports. See, this is where I can come in with my uh, argument about COVID statistics. Oh, great. (laughs) Well, radium, in order to actually die from it, to get sick, you have to ingest it. You have to eat it or you have to it has to be absorbed in your body somehow. You can't just like play with radium. Well, doesn't. But don't we have these little things that get absorbed? I mean, it would absorb Force, into the yeah. body a little bit. Yeah, yeah, slightly it does. But yeah. you, 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 you got to get a just, chunk in there. Yeah, you can't just be in the same room as a chunk of radium and get radiation poisoning. Gotcha. It doesn't work that way. Marie Curie's death by radiation probably came from her extensive use of unshielded x-rays during World War I. Oh. But that only further exposes radiation as a slow, silent killer, even if you aren't vaporized in the first blast of an atomic bomb. Yeah, it's like gotcha. the jelly, the radioactive poisoning, radiation poisoning is the jelly of the month club of slow deaths. <laughs> right. Because it Slowly just keeps surely. coming back. But you don't know if it was the marmalade or you the grape You don't know which jam, one it was. It was an amalgamation, perhaps. Now, while Marie Curie was a scientific genius in her own right, it was her daughter, Irene, who played a central role in developing the theories and practices that led to the creation of of the atomic bomb. The first Good job, ne- ladies. She's the first Nepo baby. She's not a Nepo baby. She was a brilliant woman and researcher. She won the fucking Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, I've probably seen with these a guys. little help from her mom. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Parks is really in love with this with this woman, huh? Yeah, man. Born on third base with radiation poisoning. <laughs> 
1926, Irene married a junior scientist named Frederick Joliot, mm -hmm. who was working under Irene at the Marie Curie Institute in Paris. Half of the Bastard Brigade's chapter on, on Irene Curie does basically say that, like, it's weird. It roasts her the whole time. It's a power <laughs> about how, like, difference. But how Frederick was, like, too hot for her, and then they <laughs> called her, him her gigolo, and that he yeah. was, like, pounding her out. She was a handsome woman. Yeah. She was definitely more concerned with radiation than than dressing. He loved her for the mind. I mean, have you ever seen Sarah Huckabee Sanders' husband? He's not totally no. ghoulish. He, no. he married her for the free transportation because he hops on her back and she can go 25 <laughs> miles. You just strap the oats to her front. She's going to be surprised when she can mud sleep. Oh, yeah. She has the ability to reverse her oh, knees. Yeah, she's, she's got a four-bit strut. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, oh, she, wow. She's a mutter. Her yeah. mother was a mutter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nepo. Nepo. Well, mirroring the work marriage relationship of Irene's parents, Irene and Frederick built on radiation experiments performed in 1932 by German physicists. That's 1932, just a year before Hitler came to power and only 13 years before America dropped the first bomb. To put it in the simplest wow. way possible, physicists in the 20s and 30s began to understand the fundamental principles of the universe at an extraordinarily rapid pace. The work of one scientist exponentially built on the work of another until mankind had a relatively deep understanding of how the universe worked on a subatomic level. It's crazy that it went from math to boom boom in 13 years. Yeah. Like it went from fully just theoretical ideas about the universe. Yeah. And but it was about where these ideas got hatched. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, these same physicists unfortunately realized almost immediately after discovering these principles that this understanding of the universe could be used to make weapons. It's basically the story of the human race. We are far too violent to be this smart. But there's something about it, because we are kind of talking about it. If this had happened in a peaceful country during a peaceful time, the first thing you'd imagine, because just the, a peaceful world, I'd say. A peaceful world, maybe, but the idea, you'd think you're like, the that we, we split the atom, we get free energy, no one will ever have to fight for energy ever again, right. we can fuel the world. That would maybe be the first idea, but because it happened in Truly, like, yes, height of Nazi Germany was extremely dangerous. But if you want to talk about, I have, in my mind, one of the most dangerous time periods is right before. In those, like, early 30s time period when Nazis were still kind of cool, when they were up and coming, when they were just building their heat. You know what I mean? When they were coming in <laughs> yeah, there, right? The, the Reichstag fire hasn't quite yet happened. Yeah, and they're like, They ooh, got, like, 33% of the Reichstag. Ooh, where'd you get your hair cut? Like, you know, like that type <laughs> yeah. of shit. Right? Yeah, where, when, like, when fucking Madison Square Garden could be filled with Nazis. Yes. Yeah. Th at that time period, like, th these scientists, they were all largely either, you know, Jewish people that definitely were going to be the focus of the ire of the Nazi mm -hmm. party. They just saw like, oh, they're going to kill everybody with this. Well, yeah. then I would question, would it have been made in a time of peace? I don't know. <laughs> That's Probably not. I mean, well, if would have the atomic bomb been made? I'll let you decide at the end of this series. <gasps> yes. Well, basically, Irene and Frederick's experiments with radioactive substances helped another scientist to discover the existence of the neutron. Then another scientist discovered how to split that neutron and so on and so forth. But it happened real fast. Really as soon as fast. that thing kicked off, they oh, were yeah. like, they were really all jumping on the top. One discovery on top yeah. of another. Yeah. But when it came to the further discoveries of the Curie Joliot's, the creation of the atomic bomb wouldn't have been possible had they not discovered the ability to create artificial radioactivity, which is the process that creates the enriched uranium that lies at the center. Of an atomic bomb. And that's why you can find that same enriched uranium in your classic white bread. Mm. Mm, that's what keeps it white. Enriched. Keep your whites white. Nice. Uh, but, you know, because we understood immediately that in order for to get the proper chain reaction that needed to make something like an atomic bomb, you'd need very specific isotope of uranium or whatever the term is. Uranium. I think isotope. Uranium-235. Yes. And it's that thing. And we'll get into that in a little, here in a little bit. But then they yeah. had to figure out, because that happens rarely, originally like, oh, then no one will be able to make a bomb. And then they figured out, oh, but then we can figure out how to make that stuff. Yeah. Because that, that's because that's the thing is that trying yeah. to get the uranium-235, like it was almost impossible to get enough. Like they said, it would take decades to collect enough naturally to create enough to get an atomic bomb. But then yeah. they figured out with this uh, 
oh, here's how you just do it in a lab. Well, and doesn't the atomic bomb show us the power of working together? That's what this is all about. Yeah. That really is what this is all yes. about. Once we start get truly get into like the development of the Manhattan Project, you're gonna have your mind blown. Yeah. It's a whole episode of work together. <laughs> come on, come on, let's work together. <laughs> hey man, did you eat my sandwich out of the goddamn lunchroom? Dude? Oppenheimer, because you been, got me oh, again. Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, the discovery of artificial radiation, radio, artificial radioactivity, it was so impressive that Irene and Frederick were awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1934. But in a sign of the times, the winner of the Nobel Prize in biology that year was a full-on Nazi named Hans Spiemann who shoehorned a tacky Zig Heil into his Nobel Prize acceptance speech. And this wow. is a time period where people were like, What's he doing? What's that? You know, it'd be like now. It's like if I time traveled. Imagine if I time traveled back in time, right? I won the Nobel Prize. And I do my long speech about how fucking great I am, how smart I am, how I crush it. Humble day, speech. Yeah, yeah day right. by day yeah. by day. Crush everybody want to fuck me. Everybody wants to suck me, buy me dinners, buy me beers. Of Let's course I'm the Lord legal. of Chemistry. Yeah. And then I dab. You know, like, <laughs> whoa, dab. And they're like, whoa, whoa who's that cool that? future guy? <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. It, it yeah. would be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in 1934, like, the Jewish people definitely knew what he was doing. Yeah, he wasn't yeah, good. Yeah, they knew what he was doing. They were doing. like, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's not right. I didn't sign up for this kind of, sounds like CPAC. <laughs> <laughs> there was a man <laughs> named um, Gruber Kissel that was there giving out these incredible peanuts uh-huh. in the front of it. Was he, was he at the, was he in the catering company? My grandfather for- was working with labor unions at the time. Labor unions that were manufacturing what? Labor. <laughs> Ah. Yes, I can't wait. Yes, we got him. We got him against the ropes. Now, concerning the Nazis and science, we established in our MK Ultra and in our Joseph Mengele series that most of the brightest scientific minds in Germany didn't buy into Nazi ideology. Physicists in particular, most famously Albert Einstein, left Germany in droves. Can we use this series to correct? It's Einstein. Okay, Einstein. (laughs) Einstein, Albert El- Albert Einstein. Einstein. Does that make you feel better if I say it like that? Yes. He doesn't <laughs> care. He has a sense of humor. He would like the show. <laughs> he actually would. He sticks had, his tongue out. He sticks his tongue out and his ears are big yeah, and he crosses his crazy. eyes. It's so funny. funny. And I'm back in college again. He's funny. He's a funny guy. Yeah. Yes. Walter Matthau played him in that one movie. That was great. That was he it. ate out Meg Ryan or something. Yeah, I think they're actually going to get the corpse of Walter Matthau to play Henry Kissinger now. <laughs> great. It's yeah. fun. But All this contributed significantly to a huge brain drain in Germany. But it's important to remember that while Nazi Germany was definitely stuck with a bunch of psychopaths who thought that the height of medical science was sewing two twins together to see what would happen. Mangala! Oh, my goodness. (laughs) There were still plenty of brilliant minds who decided to stay behind and roll the dice. Most of them were, as we know, in the rocket program. In labor unions. Most- <laughs> no. <laughs> Most famously, you had Werner von Braun, who was brought to America after the war to head the Apollo program, which eventually took America to the moon. During the war, he developed the V-2 rockets that terrorized England. Just know wow. that a lot of the names we'll say that are involved on the Nazi end of the uh, atomic program, uh, they, they do end up eventually, some point in the 1950s, waving little American flags at a young They do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. They, uh, Betty, Betty Boop. Betty, Betty Grable. Boop loves yeah, yeah. the black. Love your denim blue jean. Yeah. <laughs> love it. Betty Grable, what a dish, you yeah. know. No. <laughs> yeah, Betty Boop violently, violently <laughs> hurt as a child. <laughs> armed, <laughs> armed. Is that what this, actually, I don't, why do, are you busting about this, about how the whole second episode is about the story of Betty Boop's molestation? Oh, I would love that. Oh my goodness. I was watching some old Hollywood films from what they did with these young actresses. Not good. The interviews. <laughs> oh, yeah. Shirley Temple. Yeah. No, no. Holy hell. What about her? <laughs> she was straight up not good. Dude. We got to yeah. get back to Werner von Braun. Yeah. We could do it. We can do a whole thing on Shirley Temple we later. We actually could. Okay. I guess. But besides Von Braun. <laughs> Only if she killed people. <laughs> no, that would be not. incredible. She could have. She I could mean, have. for the show, not for society. Yeah. But besides Von Braun, Nazi Germany managed to hold on to one of the most brilliant minds of the 20th century. A man whose arrogance, narcissism, and moral bankruptcy made him the perfect alias for Breaking Bad's Walter White. That man 
was Werner Heisenberg. My name is Werner Heisenberg, and if you cannot handle me at my worst, you do not deserve me at my best. <laughs> What's your worst? <laughs> I'm developing the atomic weapons program for the Nazi oh. war machine. <laughs> What's your best? I'm really good at making toast. <laughs> <laughs> Always know it's perfect. I look at the texture of the bread, and I know exactly yeah. what heat to apply to it. <laughs> uh, one, one seems a lot worse than, than the other. Also, at least I was bad at doing the atomic program. <laughs> Parts of it. I was bad at it. I was oh, like, my bad entirely. <laughs> well, yes. Well, Heisenberg was a bit of a boy genius at this point in history. He just won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1932 at the age of 31. Uh, these were for theories on quantum mechanics. Right. I can't explain them to you. Nope. And this had been preceded by the publishing of his famous uncertainty principle in the mm. mid 20s. I also can't explain you Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. I, I tried to. I tried to understand it. Yeah. And it's okay. <laughs> so, on a quantum, Fernando, you know it? Oh, God. No. <laughs> quantum the levels. He just furrowed his brow at you in anger. He was an engineer. <laughs> quantum leap. Quantum, <laughs> so quantums, real small, right? Things operate as both a particle and a wave. And basically, it's about how hard it does happen to be. B. Was it quantum? <laughs> was it? But it's about hard to location is a tricky thing in physics. Uh -huh. That's basically what it's about. About how saying something mm. where where something is in space time is actually very difficult to actually ascertain in and on a quantum level. Is you, it is it the, the principle that you change something by simply by the act of observing no. it? No. No. Snow. No. Well, it's about how I, 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 I say Fernando's so, giving me an almost. Kind of, it's, but it's also about how there's a what does point. What does two mean? Does that mean a almost? point and a wave. Oh, it means both. Hey. Hey, hey, good. Hey, good. <laughs> good. Look at that. Oh, God, right. we're just going to get. This is all people are going to talk about. We don't know the physics. <laughs> no, nope, nope. We are history people. We are. I look at history like yep. stories. I play them like movies in my mind. When I see fucking science writing, I just go dead. Go my whole dead, blank yep. just goes black. I had, a, I had an English professor in college who, once, who used to wear a wizard hat to school sometimes times to class because he taught literature of the fantastic well, yeah, nice think it's, it's, and how much did that class cost you? I, was, welcome was, to Asperger's University <laughs> yeah. it was quite yeah. possibly uh, the most valuable class I took in all of uh, oh. the, the whole entire well, English department there yeah. is. and of course Quantum is Quado's uh, brother and uh, he used to hang out in uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Kissel, asshole. Don't run out of steam on this <laughs> episode my friend. Oh buddy the steam train keeps on going. Yep it is getting Steamy. But the point is that Werner Heisenberg had a reputation the world over for being a top mind in the field of physics, and history proved him to be one of the most influential scientists of the 20th century, despite the fact that he actively worked on making an atomic bomb for Adolf Hitler. Well, there was also the massive whitewashing process that happened after the war yeah. to try to distance him uh, and his legacy from what he did mm -hmm. uh, for Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Now, in private, Heisenberg claimed to loathe Nazis. Whatever. But if you read between the lines, it seems like Heisenberg more found Nazis to be like, you know, like annoying and like kind right. of embarrassing. Well, he said that he wanted to be apolitical. Like, and so that was his idea. He's like, all he wanted to do was pure science. Right. And he didn't. He hated the activity of the world. He wanted to be what? Isn't it Dr. Manhattan? In the Watchmen, where he's mm. like, I'm sick of being in these humans' lives and, yeah, and dealing yeah. with and dealing with their cycles. He was kind of like that, where he just yeah. wanted to do science in a room. But, you know, when it's the Nazis, <laughs> then you got to choose a side. I yeah. feel like, you know, for something like this, especially it's like, yeah, you're not just serving peanuts at the at the, at the for in a catering world yeah right? i mean like i mean it's not like he's deciding like whether like oh i can't fucking work for that guy because yeah, i don't like his opinion on the capital gains tax yeah yeah like, like it's, it's different fucking nazis it's the nazis i mean i can't work with that guy <laughs> fucking bullshit <laughs> well heisenberg claimed that what mattered most was the continuation of his beloved homeland of deutschland germany the fatherland mm -hmm. and it didn't matter to him who was running it it means nothing well this of course was a convenient an excuse. This was a justification. What mattered most to Heisenberg was Heisenberg and yes. how smart people thought Heisenberg was. If you've seen German women, you know it's the motherland. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, man. He, he's just because yeah, that's the idea of like he thinks all countries can talk like they're a part of the Pee Wee Herman map. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, they can't. They can't. No. Germany doesn't give a fuck. Germany's 
tectonic plates and mountains. Germany doesn't exist. Well. It's not. It's just a land map. Borders ain't real. Yeah, uh, Germany right. is well, a construct, man. Yeah, man you guys are did. really helping out. The <laughs> <laughs> Very good. But even though Heisenberg was often harassed by the Nazis for practicing the quote-unquote Jew physics of Albert Einstein, hmm. they said they're like, why are you always doing Jew physics? Why don't you do Aryan physics. Aryan I, physics is so much better. But I, Aryan physics are all like, how many like bratwursts can you fit into a canister? And, <laughs> like none of them are really. Well, it's also it's ancient math. It's yeah. all stuff that, that well, got like, completely like rolled over by the theory of relativity. Well, it's like organ energy. You know, it's it's shit like that. It's like how can we use crystals to levitate its continents? Yep. Like they're talking about the science of Lemuria. Real stuff. <laughs> well, there's a lot of people that still believe that. I think a former president, as a matter of fact, believes you just get a certain amount of time alive on Earth and then you just die so there's no need to exercise. Exercise actually hurts because it drains your energy and then you die earlier. <laughs> there's like a lot of people that believe that. God. Isn't that weird? It well, is. Well, just like Walter White made meth with no thought towards the consequences of his decisions, just so long as his ego was fed, so too did Werner Heisenberg develop atomic weapons for the Nazis without caring what the Nazis might do with an atomic weapon. But to that analogy, they also realized they were going to die. They knew that no way did Adolf actually think that this was going to last forever. I was talking with my grandfather. And <laughs> oh, the God. one thing is Germany is the size of Wisconsin. They knew they were fucked. So I think there was also like at the end, they at, knew the they end. Were fucked. at the very, very the, end. They, 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 knew were, they were. This is at them. They're their most confident. The most confident. Not so only, they didn't know they had terminal cancer yet. No, no, no. no. Not no. only were they at their most confident at this point, they were at their most powerful. Like they're about to put the entirety of Europe on its heel. Everybody yeah. rolled years. over for them. They just got done. And at this point, you know, you're watching them take Poland, take Denmark, take all these things. Not the, quite. Oh, we're almost but there. You know what I mean? Like it's. At that point, that was that machine was gearing up. Right, they yeah. were ready. They yeah, were... The, the military machine was gearing up, and they had a plan for that. Like they had a plan yeah. for turning it from Wisconsin into the Midwest. Well, it's because they just flip every because they all thought like once everybody gets a whiff of this Nazism, they are gonna love it. And, and some, it just, some did, and some did. Yes, the majority, especially your people. Yeah, yeah. the Polish. They I know it's bad. Loved it. It was bad. It was bad. <laughs> now in the beginning. <laughs> When the Nazis were trying to root out anyone with Jewish sympathies prior to World War II, Heisenberg was given a lot of shit for not declaring his support for Hitler in public like Hans Spiemann had done with his Nobel Prize, Zig Heil. Uh, but the thing about Heisenberg was that his mother was friends with Heinrich Himmler's mother. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's all just about women that quilt together. Yes. Basically, well, they called him a white Jew in the newspaper. Yeah. It was a whole thing. They kept calling him a white Jew. And then he freaked out because, again, the neutrality swung both ways. He was trying to have it all in one go. Yeah, he right. didn't want to choose a side. And he wanted to make sure he could play whoever was there to pay him a check. He was he wanted to be there. for. Mm -hmm. So Heisenberg went to the head of the SS directly, Heinrich Himmler, one of the most terrifying people in Nazi Germany, yeah. to complain that he was being harassed. And he felt that he had the right to do so. So, because their mothers were friends. My son is getting flames on the internet. That is literally what it is. It's like wow. you have your mom go yell at Donald Rumsfeld because somebody <laughs> is fucking literally making fun of you on Instagram. Live from your grave. <laughs> anytime, put it right here. And anytime someone comes into the room or opens the door, it doesn't matter if I have my headphones on. No one's sneaking up on me. So you bought a re recording? <laughs> Well, we don't. It's a non sequitur. At this no, point. no. But we just did a bathroom break, and Marcus just said he bought rear view mirrors for his computer monitor so that we can't sneak up on him. So nobody can sneak Sounds up. Sounds like him. a real Himmler to me. Yeah. <laughs> what are you being a Himmler? <laughs> also, orcs do reproduce. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> now Heisenberg was important to Nazi Germany, but he wasn't that important. So to prove that he wasn't sheltering Jewish people because he practiced, quote unquote, Jew physics, he actually requested a full up the ass investigation from the SS, complete uh -oh. with wiretaps and spies. That is the whitest thing I've ever heard. Rat ratting yourself out to the Nazis. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, it was a fine investigation. Did come through with a couple of different sexual kinks, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But they, they, it is, it's crazy. Nobody wanted the direct attention no. of the SS. No. Nobody. Yeah, because if they find something, they are going to kill you. Yes. Right. Out of principle. 
Now, this, of course, infuriated Heisenberg's wife. She resented the intrusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But all Heisenberg cared about was that his scientific honor was intact. Don't worry, baby. We're going to brand it as Vanderpump rules. (laughs) Whoa. He even capitulated to the Nazi command when they said that he couldn't mention the names of any Jewish scientists. It made the teaching of the theory of relativity particularly difficult. Well, again, this is more, it's fascist, dumb brain games. Yeah. Where they go and they're like, you can teach these principles. You cannot say who made the principles because then they get everybody gets all like, oh, they sound nice. Oh, they right. sound cool. Albert you know Einstein, I mean? his new name, Florf Gorperson. I mean, say Florf Gorperson from here code. on code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cherry Daddy Michelson. Mm. <laughs> well, even after Kristallnacht, Oh. Arguably opening night for the Holocaust. Oh, wow, it was. Um, <laughs> it's a show. It's a show. <laughs> no. I mean, it's fucking horrible. It's a yeah. fucking crystal knocked. Yeah. Heisenberg saw this. He was there. He was like, oh. He refused to leave Germany. He said that someone needed to stay behind. Someone needed to defend German science. Mm-hmm. He said, quote, Germany needs me. Oh. Actually, they don't, though. No. No, Germany no, no. actually the, the Germany does not does not need you. No, we no, don't no, want no. Germany to have you. No, not at this right. point. No, no. Man, I sometimes think if like if it wasn't for Hitler, like truly the most brilliant minds on earth were in Germany. Yeah. Oh, like, you know, it's it was fucking the, incredible. Well, that's kind of what they're. This is where Heisenberg is coming from. Germany was like the center of nuclear physics on the forefront of all of these sciences. And as the Nazis took over, they, the brain drain happened. They all went scattering and running. But it was that's what Heisenberg meant by, I need to defend German science, yeah. which is basically mm-hmm. mean, like, it's LeBron staying in Cleveland. Right? <laughs> it's that thing where he's just like, well, they, I have to stay. Right. I have to. Do, right. Oh, because now he becomes number one. Yeah. Yeah, Everybody else sure. leaves. Now I'm the big bad daddy left. Yep. Sometimes you got to go and come back, though, to win that championship. Mm. We learn that the hard way mm-hmm. by sitting on tele- sitting at <laughs> home, watching it <laughs> <laughs> on television. Mm-hmm. Now, even though America's work on the atomic bomb was a closely held secret all throughout World War II, every physicist worth their salt had known that an atomic bomb was not only possible, but inevitable since the mid-30s, before World War II even began. Wow, it sounds like how I have been talking about AI and drones because a drone just killed a soldier. (sighs) Yeah. I guess. (laughs) We haven't gotten there yet. I hope we don't. Now, after Irene and Frederick Joliot Curie accepted the Nobel Prize for their work on artificial radioactivity, an Italian scientist named Enrico Fermi figured out before Irene and Frederick's speech was even over that their discovery could lead to a weapon that could create an explosion the likes of which the Earth had never seen. You know what? I think that the Italians, yes, very smart, but you can't be that smart when the food is so good. (laughs) Because you've got to take breaks. It's just you're happy. I've been saying this. we got to do, I was was talking about as we were prepping for the show, but like I really want to do a Mussolini series because I really, that is the one thing I know the least about in terms of World War II is Italian fascism and what sauce goes with that. Yeah. I know Mussolini. It sounds so good. Clams and everything Mm -hmm. else. I could definitely see it. Hitler sounds like a plate of rocks that has shit in it. But it's like, I don't even (laughs) know how to say it because like maybe I'm completely incorrect, but it does sort of feel like Italian fascism was kind of like fascism light. Like it was like, oh, I don't it was like a so. groovy fascism, I, I would, but I don't know. I don't I'd think so. say it's fascism with a smile. Ooh. I think it's still pretty strong over there, isn't it's still, it? I mean, it's bad, but it's fascism with a smile. Longer mustaches. <laughs> I guess. So better food. True. Well, working off Irene and Frederick's discoveries, Enrico Fermi discovered that under the right conditions, any element could become radioactive, which put in place the next piece of the puzzle of how to make an atomic bomb. Okay. See, after Fermi, radium had been the primary element for radiation experiments. However, radium had become extremely expensive because of its wide commercial use at the time. Hmm. It had been, <laughs> they were starting to use it in hair tonics, bath salts, Ooh, man. face creams suppositories. You got a kid that has teeth that are too good. Try radium cereal every breakfast. Um, Suppositories. uh, You trying to make your butthole glow? uh, (laughs) One of the most popular toothpastes at the time was radium toothpaste. Oh, yeah. We'll we'll get into that later. Whole glow. (laughs) Whole glow for your asshole. Have whole glow for your asshole. My favorite, though, is radium condoms. Radium condoms were made by a company called Nut X. 
Not they, not X. They had the slogan. This is seriously the slogan printed on the tins. Get it, next it, to Nut X. <laughs> they called it Nut back then nut too. At, yeah, maybe it was Nick New Tex. New Tex. New Tex, but get next to New Tex. I don't know, they, but it said "Ask for them by name." <laughs> okay, <laughs> give me some Nut X. Well, usually I go to the store and just point and grunt. Get out! But get I get Can I get some cummy cancer socks? Please. Thank you so much. Thanks. But as a result, radium was sitting at the extremely high price point of four million dollars per gram in today's currency. Dang. But with the discovery that any element could be made radioactive under the right conditions, the element of choice for radioactivity experiments became the element that radium was extracted from. It was considered a junk element at the time. Nobody wanted it. But pretty soon, everybody wanted uranium. Everybody wants up! <laughs> yes, indeed, yep. uranium. And uranium, I think, and then I think, I think, I think it was chosen because the right conditions for making uranium radioactive was easier than making, like, say, iron radioactive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, it already coexisted with a naturally radioactive substance. Your, your uh, hypothesizing is lost on us. Completely <laughs> correct. He's completely <laughs> he correct. He must be. I'm just going to record everything that he said for the test. I'm going to regurgitate it. I'm going to get an A. Yeah. yeah. I think. I'm just trying. I'm just using logic for why they didn't use, like, fucking dirt. I'm really just mad already because the Oppenheimer movie is not going to do this, but I know that there's going to be a movie that comes along where it's just every sequence is going to be set to some 1980s song where they're all like, I think we just found uranium. Like, and it's just going to be them all like with sunglasses on I and like surfboards and shit. I just, um, You're is cool. the Oppenheimer going to have that? Is it going to have a, no. wait a second. I've just become death. Destroyer of worlds. <laughs> the sun so. sunglasses down and shit. Well, he doesn't have that much fun. I mean, he's creative, but not fun. He's not fun. You're yeah. uh, Oppenheimer? Oppenheimer is a complicated character. We're going to get Oppenheimer's a very oh, interesting character. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. more just about the movie oh, Oppenheimer. the movie. He's going to be a brooding little bitch. I guarantee yeah. it. Silly well, Murphy's great, though. If you're going to do, if yeah. you're going to have one, that's him. He is great, but he's going to be, if you put Silly and Murphy in there, he's right. going to brood. Here, you know, I'll do, I'll do an impression of Silly Murphy and Oppenheimer. Already. You ready? All right. It. Well, you know, if they Just silence staring, because you know there's going to be ten words in the movie. If, yeah. they, if they made him a rabbit, they could call him Hoppenheimer. Yeah. Save it, save for it, what? save this it. This is what I'm saying. We're going to do a whole Oppenheimer episode. Hoppenheimer. <laughs> Now, up until 1938, the idea that one could split an atom and release the incredible energy contained therein, it was theoretical. It's the idea of chain reactions. If you split one atom, then another atom will be split and another and another, and they will then split so fast, and so many of them will split so mm -hmm. fast that it will create a massive release of energy, an explosion, a nuclear explosion. You know Absolutely. How, it's like if you order Sonic and Taco Bell, consume that in the same night. The next yes, morning, you're going to have a cosmic explosion. But <laughs> you see, then the element you're truly missing is what they'll have to figure out is if you really want to expand mm. your range, your splatter range of your liquid shit, yes. you're going to want to get as thin and as strong of a toilet paper tube that you could put right against your asshole yeah. in order to concentrate the force of the splattering yeah. diarrhea up through a tube and up and out and direct the energy outwards. That's yeah. really how you get yourself an atomic shit bed. All yeah. right. Thank you, Professor Zabrowski. Mr. Parks, you could learn something from this guy. <laughs> I do things a little differently. <laughs> no pants. <laughs> no pants at crappy university. <laughs> Remember, this is 1938. Hitler has been in power for about five years. The concentration camps are built. The mm. tanks are massing on the borders. Shit is about to go down. And so it was particularly frightening that the man who took the splitting of the atom from theoretical to practical was a German right. named Otto Hahn. Nuclear fission had been achieved. The power of the sun had been unlocked and it had all been done inside Nazi Germany. Well, at least he was in safe hands. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Honestly, it was in safe hands because they <laughs> fucked it all up. Yeah. Now, Otto Hahn had no love for the Nazis, so he leaked his findings to scientists outside of Nazi Germany saying, oh, fuck. This guys, the guys, the Nazis. Yeah. I figured out how to do this. They're eventually going to have access to this knowledge. 
do something. This is a real life horror movie. This is opening up the box in fucking Hellraiser. No, this shit mm-hmm. is like, wow. This is all the opening, I imagine, of this movie where you're just like, because it's so, especially in the book, The Bastard Brigade, it's all like these m- forces all running towards the center, towards mm, each other, yeah. about to collide. Now, Enrico Fermi immediately recognized that nuclear fission could be harnessed into a weapon, especially in the hands of a group as aggressive as the Nazis. Another scientist who realized this was a Jewish refugee from Hungary named Leo Szilard. Szilard knew that Fermi and Frederick Joliot had confirmed Otto Hahn's findings on nuclear fission, and they planned to publish their finding. Mm. Szilard begged them not to. Yeah. Do not do it. And Fermi agreed. But Mm. Joliot, being stubborn in a way that only the French can be, he refused. Mm. He argued that if they did not publish, they would be betraying the very principles of free speech that Hitler was threatening to destroy. The French are immoral people in their own way. I know. <laughs> like, sometimes speech like that can be too free. You're talking about willy-nilly speech. There's wow. difference. Well, basically, he was saying that if we don't do this thing that might help Hitler win in reality, Hitler would win in principle, and really, which of those things is more away. important? Wow, you're which of those things away. is more important? In this principle. is French logic, very important. <laughs> what are we doing here? You know what it is, but man. Principle. You know what? Life ain't theoretical. Yeah, I mean it is. No, Everything. life is works, not your precious words. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> life <laughs> is a. I've worked the philosopher. Life is some form of box of candies. Shut up. Right. And each okay. candy yes. is different in its way. And you it's know, really some, actually not even a great analogy. Some candy cause... is radium, and you're like, oh, yeah. now I'm... <laughs> <laughs> some candies come full of cum. Full of cum, yeah. Cum. yeah. Very good. And so, where he's prior to 1939, no one had heard of nuclear fission. Joliot made sure that the whole world knew of the existence of nuclear fission. Mm. Quite possibly the most destructive force known to mankind. Yeah, man, just just pulling that string, man. Meanwhile, Otto Hahn was working from the inside, doing his best to keep what little uranium Germany had out of Nazi hands. Mm. But that became a moot point when Germany gained access to the richest uranium mines in Europe when they annexed Czechoslovakia. Thank you, Neville. Wow. Thank you, Neville Chamberlain. (laughs) Yeah, good, yeah. God, Jesus Christ, you fuckers know nothing about history. No, I know. <laughs> who never How much else is. can I know? I just feel like you threw shade on a man that's been dead for 70 years. Yeah, well, yeah. And then, it's because they, they well, signed the non-aggression they, pact. Peace in our time, my ass. They signed a non-aggression <sighs> pact, and then they all were like, now Hitler... You promise you're not going to attack the rest of us. Yeah, and he was yes. like, I swear. <laughs> and then he did not. So I do know. I do know. Thank you, Neville. No, I know. I just, the way you said it was like, he's not here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, he throw it. Yeah, exactly. We're, it feels like we're on like a, like an after Oppenheimer talk back on Bravo. <laughs> Thank like, you, okay, Neville. Okay, <laughs> Neville. Now, building up previously published works, Leo Szilard figured out how to make a simple nuclear reactor using graphite and uranium. He concluded that even though he couldn't tell you the how of the process, it was possible to use this technology to make a devastating weapon that could destroy the world, a Ooh. nuclear weapon. You could just hear the buttholes of every world leader get warmer and warmer. Like, yes, yes. I think someone's just developed a weapon that yes, can end the whole world. Yes. <laughs> yes. He also deduced that if he had come to the conclusion that such a thing could be constructed, <laughs> it was only a matter of time before the Nazis figured it out too, because remember, they still got Heisenberg. Mm. With this information at hand, Sillard knew that he needed to tell somebody, but he needed some heavies on his side, someone who could both understand the concept and have enough social clout to get the information to the right people. So Sillard set out for the magical land of Long Island. Hey, get the situation. We need him here immediately. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) That's where the most famous scientist in history, Albert Einstein, was cool in his heels after he fled Germany years before. He's in fucking Long Island. Long Island. Why wouldn't you believe? Why not Long Island? It's a beautiful place. What was that story you were telling me about what happened when Sillard went to Long Island? Oh, so at the time period, because my dad talks about it, because my dad, this is when my dad was a kid in Staten Island. And he was like, it's all farmland. Yeah. Right? So you go, it was still farmland, mm-hmm. except for the major city parts. Long Island was like a farm town. And so these scientists, this is back in the day before you could figure out, also they're trying not to 
let everybody know that they've rushed from Europe to America to reach Albert Einstein to ask him these highly sensitive questions about nuclear weaponry. Okay. And so they get to Long Island, they show up, and they're literally like, I don't know where the fuck he is. Yeah, they don't got his some address. Dude from Hungary. They just know that he's there. They know what to do. And they're like, well, okay, we're lost. We're here. Uh, there's some guy trying to sell me Stromboli, and he's also trying to detail my car. <laughs> but, uh, what do I do? What's your car? Are you asking? That? But then he's like, how the fuck did we it figure cars. out where he is, right? They, like, they're like, well, Albert Einstein's the most fucking famous scientist in the world. We can just ask somebody. So they found proto little dirt, dirt bags, oh. like little kids playing in the street, just being like, Hello, children. Do you know Albert Einstein? Do you know what Albert Einstein is? And like two little prototype Long Islanders going like, yeah, I know where fucking Einstein is. I'm going to get this way. And so they, they literally, they followed two kids to go find Albert wow. Einstein. And then they just found him just in the most science, daffy scientist way where he showed up and he was like washing his pants. So he was in his underwear and his, and his shirt like outside being like, I welcome. He honestly, he invented the most pinnacle Long Island thing on the face of the planet, which is washing the stoop. Yeah. Oh, Literally yeah. just Wash in, your, in, a, yeah. in a wife beater, which was an old term that we used for an A shirt. We call them A shirts now, Henry. Right. I'm wearing one shirt. right now. I wear one every day of my life. I've been wearing one and calling them a wife lover. There you go. <laughs> Real nice. Well, when Sillard showed up and these other scientists, they showed like Sillard showed up. He explained how a nuclear reactor could be made. And Einstein said something along the lines so of like, Oh, man, I never fucking thought of that. Oh, no <laughs> shit. God damn it. Yeah. Literally, because you kind of, because th- again, positive aspects, theoretical aspects, yeah. too. And it's, it's, kind a, of, it's a building on Einstein's work. It's right. just kind of excited about these concepts now because, it, you know, it's, it's interesting. Imagine if we found out that, you know, uh, not to be anything, and some people might say it, that true crime comedy podcasting was one of the most devastating forces in the face of the planet. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> sure. And if you told us that now, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. being like, you know, it's about to destroy the Hulk and the whole thing. And we're like, I just wanted to do a show that we didn't have to pitch to somebody. <laughs> right, just to show that we could do on our own. Yeah. 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 And so Einstein, Sillard, and a handful of other scientists sent a letter to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in an effort to convince him to immediately start a massive nuclear research program to develop an atomic bomb before the Nazis could do so. And it, uh, as soon as FDR read that, he jumped over his desk. Yeah, he, he did. ran yeah. down the <laughs> hallway. Yes, he, did. he got in his little vulnerability chair uh-huh. and rolled out to let everybody know what was going on. You yeah. think it's fake. You thought it was you fake. You don't think he's in a wheelchair. And it's you don't not think the that- only conspiracy conspiracy theory I might believe. <laughs> <laughs> that one is like, doesn't even make sense. That why? is my main Why would he all. fake it? It didn't help him. Yeah, it didn't. It, it was, they had to hide that he was in a wheelchair. Yeah, all the Sympathy. time. Sympathy. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> From Ameri- who? From who? Americans don't need, we don't like that in our leaders. Yeah. No weakness all. can ever be shown. I feel like it might, I don't know, I think I might be right here. <laughs> <laughs> I do think he may have stabbed a pencil into his leg and not felt it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that would be yeah. cool. Now, either these scientists were actively lying to themselves about what they knew about human nature, or they were showing just how little they understood people. But they reasoned that the creation of the atomic bomb would actually accomplish world peace. Sure. But in some ways it did. Yeah. I mean, they they had the theory of mutually assured destruction. Yeah. They figured that once countries have possessed atomic bombs, then there would have to be a higher authority established to keep countries from using them. Because we'd all blow up the entire world if nuclear war were to occur, and nobody was crazy enough to do that. Well, nobody at- is crazy <laughs> enough to use an USA. atomic bomb. USA, yeah. USA. <laughs> but if you look at like India and Pakistan, totally worked. They haven't uh, killed each other yet because uh, they both it, got the bomb. It's the Russians simmering. in the U.S. It's simmering. I mean, that's the, the thing. Russians in the U.S. We would have had a land war without a doubt during the Cold War. We would have won that land war. Yeah, we would have won. Yeah. Maybe they still have the Soviet Union. Go in the winter. Yeah. He's still the Soviet Union. They were pretty yeah. tough. Yeah, yeah don't go in the winter. Yeah, they're very, very tough, but they were but also decimated. Some... They were decimated by the end of World War II. And yeah. they, yeah, they. We had they... our opportunity. <laughs> we <laughs> had our opportunity. Had a real good there. chance of catching them with their pants down. Yeah. There is yeah. some truth. I mean, technically, this is four steps away from me saying we need to arm teachers. Yes. <laughs> but there is some truth to the idea of if everyone is well, uh, armed with deadly force, I, then I, no one, then peace can be assured. I feel that is a philosophical point that one can argue, but we fought. I mean, so far. We're, mostly we just shows that you how many wars can be fought by proxy and in a cold fashion. You can get real creative. Yeah, that's 
thing. Vietnam still happened. Korea still happened. Like we're, Afghanistan we're doing it still, right now. Afghanistan, we're fighting, both we're fighting Af- Russia in a land war in Ukraine right now. <laughs> both Afghanistan mm. still happened. Could have been worse. <laughs> could have been worse. It could have been worse because we, we, we might not have gotten all that great music. But actually, you know, again, going back to my earlier thing, we probably would have just used it during Vietnam. Uh, well, that's the thing is that we will get into later about yeah. how... Um, the spies that were within the Manhattan Project actually prevented America from using nuclear weapons in Korea. We were just so Good. excited. We were really jazzed about it's like it. It's like when I get a really big boot. It's yeah. like when I get a new <laughs> pair of shoes. I yeah. want to wear them immediately. You yeah. just want to wear them on the rainiest, muddiest day possible and ruin them immediately. Yeah. Well, and the thing is that these guys did sort of pre, you know, they did sort of, you know, foresee like the U.N., you know, which was there sure. to oh, yeah. you know, you negotiate all things. Shit, we need yeah. all this shit. We need a but, lot of new rules. Yeah, but the problem was that they thought that if nuclear war was abolished, because they thought that there would be this thing, you know, yeah. this big, uh, you know, uh, this gigantic organization that was going to abolish nuclear war because everybody had nuclear weapons, then all war would be as- abolished. Hmm. There would never be a war <laughs> again. Uh, Little do they know biological warfare is so fun. Never <laughs> go to war again. <laughs> never go to war again. Come on, guys. The war's pretty nice, right? Come yeah, on, there's guys. a lot of ways we can kill people, dude. War's really good. Uh, but that's the thing, is that they thought that they were harbingers of peace. They thought that by creating the (sighs) nuclear war, it would usher in the age of science. And that's the thing. Sadly, this is the exact same thought Alfred Nobel had when he invented dynamite. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the dynamite. Exact, he thought this exact same thing. It's, it's almost like they didn't learn the lesson. It's they al- didn't even finish Mount Rushmore. <laughs> <laughs> it's also the same argument that was made by the tech utopians of the 90s yeah. who created the second most dangerous weapon born in the 20th century, the internet. Yeah. I thought you were going to say the Hot Pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say just, it's just a weapon at dinner time. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> but no, but no matter how naive these physicists were, oh. the creation of the nuclear program started sounding pretty damn good to FDR as summer turned to fall in 1939. Yes, I, you just see FDR like Martin Short in Arrested Development, where he's like, "Pick my legs up on the desk. I've got something to say." <laughs> yeah, I feel like I would have dragon been, toss me, toss, toss me. me. <laughs> ah! <laughs> well, in September of 1939, Hitler kicked off World War II. He invaded Poland, and he was soon giving speeches saying that the Nazis would soon have access to a weapon that no country could defend against. What's that day like where you're just like, oh, my God, like the night before. Oh, yeah. Like, what is Hitler like? Is it like glee? Is it Christmas? Yeah, I think is it he was. fear? It, is it like, uh, let's do a bunch of drugs? It's a lot of rocking back and forth because he was on a lot of mess. He like, was a weirdo, God. too. And they, they you know, uh, he was... <laughs> He was pretty weird. Yeah, yeah that's the worst, you can, <laughs> the worst thing you can say about Hitler is a little bit of a weirdo. weirdo. Well, with these speeches, the Allies assumed that Hitler was talking about the atomic bomb. And as it turned out, the assumptions were correct. Oh. Two weeks after the invasion of Poland, Hitler summoned a handful of German physicists to a secret conference in Berlin. There, they were given the task of developing an atomic bomb for the Third Reich. And they dubbed this group, they gave it the goofiest fucking name in the world. They called it the Uranium Club. Yeah. It sounds like they opened up for Duran Duran in the 80s. <laughs> uh, it sounds like a shitty after school science fair. Hate it. Really, it's like, it sounds like the place where kids who get bullied a lot just have to go for an hour after school for the bullies to leave. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a hiding place. Uh, but Werner Heisenberg also, uh, he, you know, these guys all got the ability to not go to the war. Yeah. So mm. Hitler had given a, like, I think it was like a small amount of passes. It's like, like 400 passes. They, they could have just, uh, they could have just faked bone spurs. But no, <laughs> but all, the only, but it's very interesting. It was actors, singers, artists. That's who he, people he handpicked, people he liked. Yeah. Right. Including a couple of Jewish people because that is the, he decided was the thing he can pick and choose who he wants. Mm. And then the, a lot of these scientists, other ones, they had to go fight. They mm-hmm. literally had to go get guns and they were drafted and forced to go. Mm. This group, this group though, which is also very appealing to Heisenberg because one of his biggest fears during this whole time was, please don't send me to war. Yeah, please don't I, send me to war. That's yeah. rational. Oh yeah, because he was, he didn't want to go. But honestly, technically at the time, it makes you a pussy. Mm-hmm. Now I understand well, it, but it, during World War II, it made you a pussy. Well, I would, I'll take the term for, I'll, you call me a pussy. You go right ahead and you call me a pussy and I'll call you a corpse in five years and move on. Also, have you ever heard of Stolen Valor? I'll just pretend I was there. Yeah, that's incredible. 
Now, even though Werner Heisenberg was naturally a member of the Uranium Club, Germany had experienced a serious brain drain since the Nazis had come into power in 1933. It had only gotten worse. The scientists left behind were therefore not the brightest bulbs on the tree. Hmm. And Heisenberg himself had his own problems because he completely lacked a moral compass amongst many other personal failings. Well, he also showed up and he was he's used to being the smartest guy in the room, being the number one guy. Everybody's literally trying to suck his dick. But then like the guy that's his boss on the Uranian Club mm -hmm. is this like Nazi flunky. This yeah. guy that they all made fun of. This guy that they would joke about how like his hair was always mm. messy and his lab coat was always fucked up. And he just was this like weird nebbish piece of shit that would, but he was an ardent Nazi. Yeah. And again, it was yeah. trying to cut all of the quote unquote Jewish science out of it, which meant the correct stuff. Yeah. It's like how you fail up at News Corp, the parent company of Fox you News. You just mm -hmm. say, yeah, you just, you, you basically hate your way to the top. Yeah. Absolutely. But nevertheless, even with all that, the Uranium Club still came far too close to delivering an atomic bomb to Nazi it Germany. Is mm. close. Now, in order to build an atomic bomb, one needs enriched uranium. Which and most of the time I bring uranium to um, uh, my various pottery classes and we mm. go out there and we talk a lot about history. Enriching it culturally is what you oh, were talking God, that about. That was horrible. That is so... <laughs> well, you know what? Well, you know what? You know what? That's okay, though. <laughs> Because the arts, much like science, it's about failure. Subjective. Uh -huh. and science is not really that subjective, but art is. But my yes, words. But it's about failure, and then <laughs> life oh, is work. Yeah, life is work. That, 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 yes. Well, that became the Uranium Club's first task. Okay. Briefly put, naturally occurring radiation is no good for the chain reactions needed to make fission. That's uranium two thirty eight. Uranium two thirty eight. That's naturally occurring. What the Uranium Club needed was uranium two thirty five which had to be separated from U-238 in a process called enriching that I can't explain to you. Fantastic. You go and you take them to a painting class. <laughs> you take <laughs> them to a natural we history museum. An opera, perhaps. Yeah, something. Uh, yeah. The next step for the Uranium Club, however, would be the science experiment that unknowingly decided the fate of the entire world. Uh-oh. The Germans needed to build a nuclear reactor, which was the next step in understanding how to actually make an atomic bomb go boom. Now, by this point, Heisenberg had fully put away any trepidations he might have had towards the Nazis. And for him, the Uranium Club became a chance to prove himself to the same Nazis who had admonished him for using, quote unquote, Jew physics. Mm -hmm. In other words, Heisenberg was developing the atomic bomb for the Nazis out of nothing more than personal pride. He well, wanted, the thing is, well, the swastika is actually a Buddhist symbol of not giving a fuck. <laughs> so I've decided not to give a I fuck. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> no, he uh, he was a real uh, he was a real prick. He yeah. definitely wanted to be the guy mm -hmm. that invented the atomic bomb, no. and he would be whoever it was, well, whoever's team he was on. He wanted to be that guy, but he also was like trying to kind of figure out where does he fit within the ecosystem of the scientific world yeah. while within so he, Nazi Germany. His ego was in real time. He was like, this is going to be huge. For I'm going to be historic. This, this is going to be, be for me. Yes. Yeah. Basically, he wanted to be Einstein. Well, he also, what Einstein became, right? Absolutely. Yeah. He also kind of had this concept of because he was, quote unquote, it's not, it's not so much pro-Nazi and pro-Germany because he was like, the problem is if somebody else uses the atomic bomb, they're going to use it on us. Yeah. He oh, didn't of want, course. Yeah, he didn't yeah. want it to be used on Germany. Right. But the thing is that- like, ironically, he, again, it wasn't. Yeah. We, they got real close. The thing was is that he he's, even though he's not Einstein, he's still fucking Heisenberg. Yep. He's still one of the most brilliant men of the 20th century. Very famous Nobel Prize winning, known around the world. Oh, you guys seem to really have uh, his accolades right on the top of your heads. Uh, I mean, hey, man, it is uh, just the truth. But the thing Thing is, the point is, is that that wasn't enough for him. Mm. He wanted to be seen as a guy who could do work on solid, practical things. He, a guy who could build things, who can make things, move out of the theoretical into the practical. And he had absolutely no hesitation handing over the most powerful weapon to ever exist to the most evil people to ever exist if that proved that he could do something. Don't there do are it. some people that are more evil than that, like the people who sit in the center seat in an airplane row and take both of the fucking arm handles. Yeah, wow. that's really rude of them. That's really to do that, rude. But technically, I would actually argue that's theirs because you have the aisle and the window. Liebenstrom! I actually don't know. <laughs> What that's actually a fine that's that is actually a construct of the airlines continuing to make the seats smaller, having us fight for less and less land yeah. and charging us more. So there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of anger and a lot of rage. I'm actually with Ben on this. Yeah, one. yeah because the center seat, if they don't take both of the arms, 
Which arm do go? they take? What, Where do they also, go? I find sit? it interesting that a simple throwaway comment from me does generate conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, are, you, are you arguing it's a, it's that you're chain. currently enriching us? <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> it's a chain reaction. Marcus Sparks 41. What? <laughs> That's me enriching you. That's me enriching you. Now I'm 41. Ah, yes, I used to be it. Marcus Parks, 32. Yep. Now, now you're I'm 41. 41. Okay. Soon to be, actually. Yeah. yeah, really. As it was put in the book, The Making of the Atomic Bomb, Heisenberg saw physics as blood sport, and he brought this attitude to everything in life. You did not want to play this guy in ping pong. Ugh, they said yeah. he was just an annoying He was miserable shit. as fuck. Yeah. yeah. Now, by December of 1939, just three months after he was put on the project, and this speaks to the speed in which this shit happened, it seemed as if Heisenberg was on the fast track towards an atomic weapon. So he opened a test chamber for nuclear reactors in a small lab in Berlin, codenamed Das Virenhaus. What'd that mean? The virus house. Yeah, so nobody would go oh. near it. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. However, it's at this point that both the brain drain and Heisenberg's own blind spots started to show. A scientist named Walter Botha was put to the task of creating fissionable material. This was the same experiment Leon Sillard had done with graphite and uranium, the one that had set off so many alarm bells. Mm -hmm. But the thing was, was that Walter Botha wasn't as smart as Leon Sillard. Uh -oh. He did the same experiment with graphite and uranium, but when Walter Botha did it, it didn't work because the graphite Botha was using wasn't pure enough and he didn't think to check if it was. But he didn't oh. even think that maybe it's not pure enough. It's very, it's kind of interesting because there's some happenstance here. Because about the graphite that they mined out of Germany had too much boron in it naturally. Mm. And that's what caused the issues with it. While the graphite that we mined in America when we were working on the Manhattan Project naturally had less boron in it than made it already workable. Like it made and, it already kind of workable. And, and Czechoslovakia too, right? That was well, that's the one where that had, got that's the uranium, uranium from. Oh, so that's the German uranium. But the you. stuff in here, so now you start to kind of, there's a conspiracy yeah. theory about Werner Heisenberg, right? Because they're saying now, like after this fact, everyone's saying like, but actually, Werner knew secretly that the Nazis were bad. So what he was going to do was sabotage the bomb from inside <laughs> yeah, while working on it, ass. which is absolutely <laughs> not true. Fucking no, ass. it makes it's, sense. It, it makes it clear. It clears. But what they point towards... That's what my grandfather did. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that would be incredible. I yeah. would love to reveal the that. The Nazis wouldn't have lost without my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. All they need is the proper lazy German to <laughs> finally <laughs> slow the machine. It's like a very handsome, very hardworking. Um, but yeah, they, so Werner Heisenberg, I called it because at some point they're asked about budgets, right? They, they want to come in. They want to ask be like, OK, how much money is going to cost? We need an atomic bomb. We need it right now. We want a killing blow. We want this shit right now. We want to take over Europe. We want to hold the world hostage. Right. Werner Herl Heisenberg purposely lowballed the project because he said, actually, it was only take about a couple of hundred thousand dollars, which is why they're saying that he purposely sabotaged the program because he knew truly knew that to make what, what right. he thought, according to his calculations, to make the amount of enriched uranium that you would need to would not only be impossible within the decade, but it would cost a trillion dollars. Like So he basically said all of this shit because he made massive mistake because he thought it would take something like hundreds and hundreds of pounds of uranium to make it explode. But yeah. in America, we realize it actually is a smaller amount. We, we'll get into all those details later. But Werner Heisenberg, like, said all of this shit. Yeah. They gave him this lower budget. But the reason why he did it, truly the reason why he did it, is again, my full, big, I, I was watching a couple documentaries on this, so I'm stealing this point of view, which is the concept that he knew that if you give me a million dollars in Nazi money, and I don't make the atomic bomb. Right. And right now, you guys are looking on the fast track to win. And then the Nazis win. And I haven't done this job. You've given me all this money and I fail. I'm going to a concentration camp. Sure. And so you, like, he was betting, he was still betting on Nazis winning, but he thought we'd win the old fashioned way, which is blowing up with rockets. And now he gets to do his fun little research on the side, mm. being funded, like, in this project that's not going to go so anywhere. So less well, money, less responsibility, less his head is cut off if he doesn't do well. Yes. Yeah. But I also think there's an element of ego there as well. How much more impressive would it be mm. if he would have done it on such a small budget? I think he did in some part, uh, some part of him did believe that he could still do it uh, despite the budgetary constraints. That's interesting. A lot of money needed to be spread around. So. Yeah. But then you look at what the Americans spent on it. Two billion dollars. And we were already correct on the math that they were incorrect on. So. Yeah. It's nice when you don't have to fight a land war. Yeah. 
Well, nevertheless, Walter Botha came to the conclusion that graphite couldn't be used to enrich uranium, when in fact the exact opposite is true. Hmm. As a result, the Nazis headed off in an entirely different direction, researching an entirely different and far slower method. The entirety of modern history hinges upon this blunder, because had the Nazis not changed their research focus, if they would have kept it up until they enriched that fucking uranium with graphite, it is entirely possible that Hitler would have obtained an atomic weapon while America was still trying to figure out how to get past Nazi forces in North Africa. So this is the Donner Party deciding to go. Yes, this is yeah. them being like, yeah, yeah, fuck yes. this storm. Yeah. Anyway, it's not coming yeah, for another the, couple of days. Even yeah. this, this is them taking the Hastings shortcut. Right. Oh, okay. yeah. And, and the, uh, later on, the Auschwitz-Missen, right? The group that would go to try to stop the Nazi atomic Did program. Did they open up for ABBA? <laughs> 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 but honestly, they're a badass group. Mo Berg, both a, a, he was a catcher for the Yankees and an American spy. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Well, jo- again, this guy is one of the great characters of American history. Yeah, awesome. Joe Kennedy Jr., I believe, was there. There's a couple of guys, a very interesting group of ragtag adventurers with no experience that America was willing to write off when to go to, like, <laughs> literally go. like a suicide squad. In, uh, dude, this is, I cannot believe this is not a movie. It the is. Master Brigade. Is it? Yeah, it's a and Paul that was made of oh, the yeah, catcher. Oh, awful. The catcher was a spy. It got if fucking it's a bad movie, it doesn't count. Mo yeah. Berg, they have Paul Rudd playing Mo Berg. Mo Berg Wait, looks this is like, recent? Yeah, I mean, it's like 10 years ago. But years Paul ago. Rudd. It's like yeah. 2011, I Mo think. Mo Berg no. looks like the evil baby from The Simpsons. <laughs> they never cast these historical <laughs> figures right. They yes, never do. They never do because... They don't want ugly people. Yeah. But it, they're all ugly. Ugly people created history. <laughs> and they're most successful people in the world. All right? Yeah. Well, to that point, as the, uh, all right. But you know, when the Alshash Missing went to go looking for this shit, they said that one of the first things when they got to them, when they finally found Werner Heisenberg's like famous nuclear reactor that was going to be, they thought was going to be this crazy underground cavern because they've seen these Nazi buildouts. The Nazi buildouts were huge, you know. And then all of a sudden, they, no, there's a whole fucking TV show show called Nazi Mega Weapons. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. crazy. But they went to go down, you know, it's like a basement room, and they're like. The entire nuclear program for the for the fucking the Nazis was like two rooms. Wow. He went and he was just like, "Oh wow, you guys really lowballed this." It's like shit. when we, uh, it's like when we got to tour Sun Records. That's it. Yeah, it's like it's two small. rooms, two things. It's very small. But to the point of timeline, as the Germans came relative inches from discovering the secrets of atomic weaponry, America was barely getting started. Mm. Finally, the letter begging FDR to start an atomic weapons program was delivered along with a presentation that somewhat soft-pedaled the atomic weapons point. Mr. President, we have a huge, huge memo coming in. You're going to want to stand up for this. Oh, God damn it. I'm sorry, sir. (laughs) But I can't any jumps up. He's like, whoa, (laughs) crazy. You crazy, man. You crazy. We got that piece of shit. Well, the scientist chart, yeah, you got that piece of shit that took us through the fucking depression and the World War II. You got him. You got him. <laughs> All I know is that this series is going to be longer than FDR's entire presidency. Yes, indeed. It's 12 years. He was the only one to do. Th- well, after we're never him, stopping. They, after him, they were like, we got to stop that from happening again. I don't know why. But he was good at well, it. What do you mean you don't know why? He was good at it. He was really good at it. <sighs> He just, I guess, I guess, I guess when only God one taketh, he also giveth. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, the scientists charged with convincing the president said that developing weapons would be the third use of atomic research. First, we're going to use it to produce power. Okay. Then we're going to mm-hmm. use it for medical. Sure. Then we're going to make a bomb. But all FDR heard was the words Nazi, blow up, and unbeatable weapon. I think those were the important words at that point in time. Yeah. Yes. But since this was still a project that was going through government channels, FDR gave the go-ahead to start a commission that could look into the possibility of starting a program that might lead to research on ways in which an atomic bomb program could be started. I am asleep. (laughs) This is what makes your eyes bleed. But nevertheless... This was still the genesis of what would become the Manhattan Project. Okay. And if you're questioning the urgency here, bear in mind that this was two years before Pearl Harbor. This is two years before we even got involved in the war. And we wanted nothing to do with it at the time. Well, FDR did. Yes, he did. Because, of, well, he knew. Because he, he understood. Smart. He understood. Two but, years but, before we allowed Pearl Harbor to happen. Before we, <laughs> God yeah, damn it. Tell I'm gonna, before we allowed it. Or before, if they yeah, even did fucking We still watch <laughs> FDR hide a couple of lays in his desk I mean, so people wouldn't know. <laughs> Wipe the poi off his mouth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
Now, after the Nazis had fucked up to such an incredible degree when it came to using graphite to enrich uranium, they decided to switch their focus on nuclear weaponry to something called heavy water. Basically, heavy water is exactly what it sounds like. It's water, but it's heavy. It's heavy it's water. Exhibits it's exhibits water. Yep. Yeah, it's yep. dense, dense water. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's dense water. And what? Do I have mm-hmm. to do the thing? Yeah. What? They put water in your water so you can wet your water, water while you water. water. Yeah. Well, in World War II, the stuff was considered to be eerie, almost unnatural. Mm-hmm. It freaked Winston Churchill out for some reason. He wouldn't even say heavy water. He called it the juice. Yeah, dude. It's that's scary, so much dude. scarier. It's just water that's like weird. Yeah. <laughs> this must be uncomfortable. I'm happy that that's what freaked Winston Churchill out. Yeah. Not everything else he did. Really, though, all you need to know is that bombarding an element with heavy water intensifies nuclear chain reactions. So it's therefore possible to use heavy water to enrich uranium. This, as I've mentioned, is necessary for creating a working atomic bomb. Now, heavy water is rare. It does not exist naturally. And in 1940, there was only one plant in the world that made it. That was Norsk Hydro in Norway, which at that time was the largest hydroelectric plant in the world. Hmm. Now, the market for heavy water was still small in the 1930s. The Norsk Hydro plant only sold 88 pounds between 1934 and 1938. But in 1940... The Nazis very suspiciously ordered several hundred pounds with a request for a further 220 pounds per month after that. Wow. Yeah, they knew that it was only used for nuclear experimentation. They yeah. knew that that's what it was for. So when they started doing it, because in Norway, and I mean, again, it's nice when it's not just capitalism, when they can just, not, they can really be like, Oh, I don't know if we should sell all this to the Nazis. Yeah. yeah and, well, they're and also a little isolated in their own way. I mean, they're also right next to them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the the North Hydro, they asked the Nazis, like, hey, why you want all this? The Nazis like, oh, you know. Well, what if we say, okay, all right. How would mm. I have to explain? So heavy water, right? You want to make like heavy super soup. Sick. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to make super heavy <laughs> soup. Heavy good soup. soup. Good yeah. work, Gunter. No yeah. Yeah, 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 no problem. I'm trying to make some crazy heavy soup. Yeah. 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 Mm. <laughs> heavy tomato soup. Yeah, super <laughs> fucking heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Being a soldier is hard, but man, I love this really heavy tomato soup. It really does build up against winter months. It gets so cold into the front lines. <laughs> I can't believe it. Even believe it. Well, the Norwegians rightfully assumed they're up to no good. They yeah. said, no, we're not going to sell it to you. And back on the Allied side, physicist Frederick Joliot knew that heavy water could be used in the application of nuclear fission. So Allied forces spent 36 million francs, or at least they offered 36 million francs, to buy out every bit of heavy water to keep it out of Nazi hands. But in the spirit of fuck the Nazis, Mm -hmm. Norsk Hydro offered to hand over all their heavy water for free, (gasps) just so long as someone else figured out how to get it the fuck out of there. Oh, yeah, because now the Nazis are coming for it. Right. So they were like, they wanted to save their own ass. Oh, yeah. Mm. Right from your grave. Now it's spy time. Yeah. Spy time. Yeah. So spy, to... time. spy time. Spy <laughs> time. I love spy time. So to smuggle the heavy water to the Allies, a <laughs> French intelligence officer named Jacques Allier came up with a plan. We find a big butt. Yes. <laughs> we shoot the water up the butt. I uh, don't die yeah. bad that to being. It's a heavy enema. <laughs> well, first, he had two custom-built suitcases made, one for transporting the heavy water and one meant to act as a dummy. Mm. Then, he recruited a second spy and bought two plane tickets from Oslo Airport, one going to Scotland and another going to Amsterdam. And crucially, these flights were scheduled to leave on the same day at the same time. And this is before 9-11. So you could just <laughs> drive to the plane. <laughs> yeah. Now, the Nazis had not fully invaded Norway just yet, but they still had considerable power. So their intelligence, probably leaked by Agent Allier himself, told them that the heavy water was going to be on this flight to Amsterdam. This, of course, wasn't the heavy water's destination. No, I'm heavy water. I don't even like to smoke weed. I actually would love to go to America. I heard they got good hamburgers out there. I love heavy. I mean, heavy water isn't so bad. You should see my heavy cock. That is, um, that was the, uh, heavy the, cock the water. words of Rudolph Christie, Chris <laughs> Christie's great grandpa. Yeah, yeah. Heavy water. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Agent... <laughs> Jesus Christ, you made me lose my pot spot. <laughs> no, Amsterdam was, of course, not its destination. So Agent Elier and his fellow spy paid a guy at the Oslo airport to cause a scene yes. by demanding that's to me. be let... Yeah, yeah that's, that's his job. Yeah. They, had, they had a guy go in... Hey, guys! <laughs> oh, we 
Which one? Is this a play? I better be on that plane. <laughs> if we get Marcus off his meds for 10 days, perfect. You go absolutely nuts. I'll shit all over the place. Yeah, yeah man. We you can cause me- a scene. Oh, we can. yeah. We can. But that's the thing is that this guy was paid to compl- to go in and cause a scene to let him on the plane. He was supposed to show up to his flight late and say, like, let me on the runway. Let me on the runway. Because they're going to let you on the runway after the, it's no. already left the gate. But he was there to argue to let me on the runway. I got to get on this flight. That's wow. awesome. And he, of course, it eventually turned into a physical altercation. The most important pain in the ass in history. <laughs> wow. What a, what a job. Yeah. And during the commotion, Allier and the other spy surreptitiously switched their luggage from the flight to Amsterdam to the flight to Scotland. Cool. Then they got on the Scotland flight. And while the Nazis were intercepting the Amsterdam flight midair to divert it to Hamburg. Yeah, dude, scary as fuck. They sent off fighter jets and they literally found the flight midair, grounded it, and then took everybody out. Like, very, wow. very fucking scary. Agent Allier and the other spy were telling the pilot of the Scotland flight that they were with the Allies and they needed to get to Scotland as soon as possible to outrun the Luftwaffe, who were no doubt soon on their tail. Cool. That must be so much fun to tell a commercial pilot, follow that cloud. <laughs> I think you follow that cloud. I think it's fun for us. I think it must have, I would have, it would have been scary. Oh, been yeah. Absolutely terrifying. Yeah. yeah. Thankfully, Agent Allier made it to Scotland and took the heavy water from Edinburgh to France, while the Nazis were left stamping their feet in Hamburg. Ah, I, I can, I can, you can see them, yeah, biting their hats. <laughs> so like yeah. again. Yep. They discovered that they were in possession of nothing more precious than 88 pounds of gravel. And I bet there was a fun wow. note left by the oh, oh, yeah, I've been like, Sue you in Scotland. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, you can use that to make your Hitler as long as you shit on it. Mm-hmm. Oh, the, the gravel. The gravel and shit. The but, Hitler diet. Now, just a month later, Germany invaded Norway, and although the Norwegian resistance was among the fiercest of World War II, legendary, the Nazis nevertheless quickly seized the Norsk Hydro plant, meaning they were now in control of the only heavy water production facility in the world. That's a big get. But they got to figure out how to do it, because what's interesting, Uh. I I did not know, too, is that there is a way to make heavy water inactive. It's like a you basically just dump a juice into the other cadmium. juice. You put cadmium. Yeah, in. you yeah. put some no, 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 Diet Coke in there. It's either cadmium or castor oil. It's very Something simple. bad. Something yeah. that mucks it all up. I think up, you so. shame it a whole bunch. Call oh, it yeah. all fat. Yeah, what are you doing, you dumb boy? <laughs> yeah, you can't even. You must not be healthy. You're never yeah. going to be a comedic actress or a singer in America unless you lose some weight, heavy water. It's <laughs> really sad because I feel like the heavy water needs to be built up. I agree. Yeah. I yeah. Agree. How else are we going to Enrich. Enrich the uranium. Indeed. If the heavy but water's course, got no confidence. I mean, the heavy water also needs to be learned as well. <laughs> if it gets too big, it's going to start sneaking snacks after midnight and die of a heart attack. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, the heavy water. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Life is works, not works. <laughs> now, the heavy water smuggled on the Scotland flight had made its way to the top French nuclear experts, Frederick and Irene Joliot Curie. And since the Nazis now held Norsk Hydro, the smuggled heavy water was now even more valuable. They're Mm. not getting any more of it. After receiving the heavy water, Frederick and Irene in turn arranged for it to be hidden in a bank vault 250 miles south of Paris. But after only five days, the bank manager freaked out and made them move it somewhere else. Wow. You think this fat people walk there and you put it someplace else? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and oh. this is and at this point this is France and Britain working together. That's the allies right now. Yeah. And they're like, "Okay, we got to start we got to get this heavy water somewhere." It's got to be moving. It yeah. has to be moving cuz also the Nazis are coming straight for France. Yeah, we got it. We got to get this fucking heavy water and we got to start making a fucking nuclear program now. Mm-hmm. And so after the bank manager kicked it out, it was placed in a women's prison. And then after that, it was taken to a maximum security prison where it was stored in a death row cell. And there in in the death row cell, yeah. Frederick and Irene Joliot Curie planned to set up a laboratory to conduct heavy water experiments. Isn't that a bit ironic? It ah, is. It's, it's more appropriate. If they were to say <sighs> set up nerd. the heavy water experiments no, and like say also, like a, if they were to set you know up heavy so water experiments. What's so funny about you correcting me on that? It's an indictment on you. No, it's not. Yeah, it is because it's sometimes just allow things to go. Mm. Almost like heavy water off a duck's back <laughs> or an asshole. You would poison mm. it. Mm. No, because I miss the Chicago Rippers. If, remember that? <laughs> see, if, if they were Simpler. to say set up the heavy water laboratory in a maternity ward, then no, that it's would because be ironic. it's going to lead to a lot of death. 
Yeah, that's what I. You know, you know what would be idea. ironic? No, it would be no, ironic. You're wrong. You're, you're actually it, wrong. You take heavy water experiences and you do it experiments and you do it on an air hot air balloon. <laughs> that's ironic because no. it's hot. No. Light air. No, because My with point the, totally. No, stands. because with the maternity ward, they would be creating an instrument of death. In I a won't place let of us. Life. Do you have any idea how many babies die in maternity wards? <laughs> I'm not letting us go back to the script. <laughs> no, we're not. No, we're locked. <laughs> but as fate would have it, it became clear by mid June of 1940 that Hitler's meth fueled blitzkrieg was going to make short work of the French army. Mm. So the heavy water had to be moved to England. To take on this most dangerous task of transporting top secret materials across a body of water filled with German U boats, the British called upon a Scottish coal steamer called the Broom Park. I thought you were going to say ma- Dorf. <laughs> Not to mention Dorf the- on heavy water. <laughs> the, the roast that that heavy water must have gotten from the other water. Oh. Uh, you know how people are. When, I know. You know, it's like we make fun of each other a lot, but we're like friends. But so thin water is like, hey, heavy water, you know, how you enjoying the ride? <laughs> I, uh. Actually, it would sink. The light water actually would ride on the heavy water. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, this ship, the Broom Park, was captained by the 20th Earl of Suffolk, a man named Charles Mad Jack Howard, who was basically a rich British Captain Ron. This guy's crazy. You know the 14th Earl of where? The 20th Earl of Suffolk. You know the 14th Earl of Suffolk? Yeah, yeah, I'm not him. No, no, no. No, no, no. no, 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 no. I'm the the 20th Earl of of Suffolk, so kiss me. Can you still kiss me? Please kiss me. (laughs) This is a uh, story about the crazy characters that are all within the beginnings of the OSS as well. Yeah. Because it's like, these are all guys. Like, we're going to, this is all during the Bastard Brigade time period where everyone's running back and forth. And you needed these crazy people. To make these decisions, they were deeply against their well-being. No, you had to have crazy. You had to have civilians with balls of steel to yeah. pull this shit off. Like yeah. that's, and that was that was one of the strengths of you know the allies of the yeah. British of the Americans. It was like using erratic people to get shit done because nobody could, could predict what they would do. Oh also, yeah. So little known fact: balls of steel, another side effect of radium poisoning. Oh, very much so. <laughs> yeah. They become almost like stone. <laughs> Well, when the laboratory assistants transporting the heavy water showed up to Mad Jack's boat, they found him strewn out on the deck shirtless, showing off his mm. tattoos to two ladies while making jokes hey. in a faux French accent. It's not called not Mad Max boat. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love the, the fact that he's this maniac. Yeah. It's all the maniac. He's like, oh, ha, ha, did you get my that tattoo. Hell? And they're like, this is the man <laughs> that is going to get this the most important material currently makes sense. in the world out of war-torn Ma- It's Mad Jack? Yes. Yeah, Mad yeah, Jack. I mean, this is what Mad Jack does. Yeah, Mad Jack Howard. Mm, totally makes sense. Furthermore, the crew of the Broom Park was massively hungover. <laughs> and despite the obvious urgency of the mission, they refused to set sail until they recovered. Yay, first grade. Go and get us 15 bacon and eggs. <laughs> oh, that's the best. <laughs> but eventually, they set sail carrying not just the heavy water, but two crates of diamonds valued at $300 million Ooh. in modern currency. This is all shit that had been smuggled out of Amsterdam. They're just trying to get uh. everything out of Europe they can because the Nazis are coming. They know that nobody can stop them, so let's get as much out as we can. Gotcha. It took the Broom Park three harrowing days to make it to the coast of England, but Mad Jack kept his cool the whole time, and reportedly, once they got to England safe, he laughed, slapped one of the laboratory assistants on the back, and said, man, we had a 50-50 shot of making that one. I love Mad Jack. I you know, love him. You're more likely to die on the way to the airport. <laughs> I love him. Yeah, he's the equivalent of the most insane Uber driver you've ever him. had in Dude, your life. He's Mad Captain Jack. Ron. Yeah, I love him. Mad Jack gets it done. He gets it done. Now safe in England, the heavy water was thereafter transported to a prison called Wormwood Scrubs. Oh, oh God. It I was, don't want to go there. I think, I think Wormwood Scrubs, I think it does have a weird history all on its yeah. own. It sounds familiar. But after that, it was delivered to Windsor Castle for use in any future Allied atomic bomb project, which was still at this point all but non-existent because Hitler had put the entirety of Europe on its heels. Mm. Mad Jack, meanwhile, unfortunately... Did not survive the war. Mm, diabetes. <laughs> oh. No, he died being mad. 
He blew himself up while trying to defuse an unexploded German bomb. He is funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, this apparently was like funny though. It apparently was a real like pastime amongst thrill seekers in in that during that time period where they'd go find mines and they'd and find mines and try to like it's not mines. These bombs. are bombs. Bombs. bombs that did like duds <laughs> that would land from the sky. It's mm-hmm. crazy. What a time. Now, the Nazis soon marched into Paris. They took France. And when Frederick Joliot returned to his laboratory in the City of Lights, he found two members of the Uranium Club there waiting for him, no doubt flanked by two ranking SS officers, saying how Joliot must think himself very clever indeed. Mm, how was your boat trip to Amsterdam? I hate a condescending <laughs> Nazi. <laughs> Now, the reason why the Nazis were there was because they didn't have access to a machine called a cyclotron, which was a necessary component in the study of nuclear reactions. Joliot had a cyclotron. He'd built one, a working one. Okay. So the Uranium Club basically said, sorry, but this is ours now. Uh, so we'll take a spinning machine. We'll do what we did with it. We'll spin it. We will shoot the particles oh, through good. it. Yeah. But at first, they were like, they were going to disassemble it yeah. and bring it back to Germany. Yeah. But then they're like, Oof, but spinning is already happening. Right. It's here mm-hmm. and it's local. And I prefer <laughs> to be local. a local. I like a local spin. Kind of artisanal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Joliot, meanwhile, not only allowed them to do so, but he agreed to help them, which got him branded a traitor by the French. But unlike many who made this claim later, like Heisenberg, Jolio really was staying behind to gum up the works. Double agent. Yep. He, as well as his assistants, were essential to the effort that stalled the Nazi atomic program through active sabotage. He really was wow. the he was the real deal. Oh, like, yeah. Because yeah. he learned a lot from his wife mm-hmm. and from his mother-in-law. Yeah. They were both hard bitches. <laughs> like Marie Curie was a fucking hard woman. Yeah. And she was hard on her daughter. Like yeah. her daughter was not, did not pass muster with her very often. Oh. But she went and she, it was crazy. She, yeah. Because Irene Curie got famous for bringing uh, x-ray machines the same what, what her mother did during World War II. Mm-hmm. Mm. Eventually, Joliot would become a valuable member of the French resistance, which also does not get enough credit for being fucking incredible. Yeah, we should, there's a whole episode serial. You know, World War II, we could just spend Something so about long. it, huh? Something, Something about, about it. There's a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, there was like, you know, the Vichy government, but the, the French resistance was fucking incredible. I mean, Joliot, him, just himself, he staged fake car accidents to help people escape Nazi-occupied France. He arranged fake ID cards to help French Jews to safety. He smuggled weapons. He organized raids. He personally murdered traitors and Nazi double agents. Yeah, man, this is a scientist who's got his fucking hands dirty. It yeah. sounds to me like he's committing some illegal activities. <laughs> Oh no! Interesting. Oh no! How, how you seem to praise what appears to be a villain? Oh God! Wow! He's getting, his grandfather's coming through. <laughs> it's finally <laughs> happening. But back in England, the Allies were trying to figure out what they should be doing with all this heavy water they'd gotten a hold of. Tell you what, tastes real funny. <laughs> I would imagine. I wonder what it does taste like. Well, we can't drink it. I would imagine it tastes the same. I I don't think you're supposed to taste it. I can't imagine. I wonder if you can drink heavy water. We'll figure it out later. Yeah. (laughs) No, at first, the Allies thought about just kidnapping Werner Heisenberg. They could kidnap him. He could just tell him what's going on. That would be my idea. Drinking every water in small quantities does not harm, but drinking in larger quantities for can cause dizziness and low blood pressure. Okay. Oh, well, okay. it might be good to lower it then. Maybe that's what I'm on. Yeah. But since the Nazis were at that moment at the height of their power in Europe, the idea of kidnapping scientists was tabled for later. It happened. It just happened later. Yeah, because that's totally every time. I'll bonk them. You bag them. <laughs> we kidnap them. It's a lot like that. Yeah. But in the meantime, the Allies figured that if they couldn't figure out what to do with the heavy water, then they could at least make sure that the Germans didn't have any more access to it. Therefore, the British formulated a plan called Operation Freshman to blow up the Norsk Hydro plant. Yeah, and, wow. the, and then follow right before there was Operation Verve Pipe. <laughs> That was very <laughs> devastating to all of the students. They couldn't believe what they saw that yeah. first year. Man, that song, Freshman, came on the radio the other day, and it just makes me feel I'm not good. No. no. Because it came out when I was a freshman in high school, and I was like, I think this one's about me, but then I... No, it's about seeing a murder or sucks. something. Yeah, I think it's very... Yeah, I think it, it's... It's not that... Like, uh, whatever, good band. Like I'm sorry I brought this in. That was a girl who died. 
like yeah. in a car accident or something. Something like that. Do you get uh, murdered? Like, let's just get rid of all the classes anyway, you know. So. <laughs> First year. Why don't we just call them first years? <laughs> so they do in Hogwarts. That's what they do. I know. This plan put together before America entered the war was formulated by the Special Operations Executive, which was cheekily referred to by the British as the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Whatever. <laughs> Isn't that a, a movie series now? <laughs> yes. Now, the ministry first contacted the plant's head engineer. He'd been covertly sabotaging the plant by pouring castor oil into the production lines. This, however, was only a short-term solution because the Nazis in control were going to eventually figure out that someone was sabotaging the process from the inside. Right. And again, you don't want to double trick them. Nah. Because you go to a concentration oh, you, camp. Oh, if yeah. you even make it that far. I mean, yeah, you just get shot in the head yeah. most times. So the British planned a secret mission called Operation Freshman in order to break in and blow up the filtration cells that produced heavy water. Okay. They didn't have to blow up the whole plant. They just needed to blow up the machine. A lot oh. easier. Wow. This is like the end of the uh, the Christopher Nolan first Batman. Oh, yes. No. Yes. The plan was to airdrop 30 British commandos into Norway. Then once they landed, the commandos would break into the plant and blow up the filtration cells before the Nazis knew what hit them. Cool. I hope they gave them parachutes. It was a massive and deadly failure. Uh, Good job. Total failure on all fronts. Uh. First of all, the soldiers were dropped into Norway not by parachute, but on ill-conceived contraptions called gliders. Mm. <laughs> Why don't we just use the parachutes? The, <laughs> no, the no. ones that are proven, the ones that we've used for thousands Maybe thousands. I don't know how long parachutes have been my, around. My wife's brother-in-law, he makes these new things called gliders. <laughs> oh, so we're taking your brother-in-law's pitch from Buddy, a Thanksgiving? or Please, God, take these gliders <laughs> if he fucking mentions them one more time. Nicknamed Flying Coffins. <laughs> oh, very nice. Don't like the nickname. Yeah. No, no, it makes oh, sense. Oh, we're once taking you, these? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> once you, once you We're at 40,000 feet. They're called what? Flying Coffins. <laughs> Gliders were notoriously ineffective and dangerous. These 65-foot-long craft were towed by larger planes. And then at the right point, what they guessed was the right point, they just cut the rope, no. and then you had to glide down mm. on a fucking plywood craft with no engine in silence, hoping that you would get to the right spot. Sir, can we just walk? <laughs> Is there any, I mean, it just feels like, sir, I didn't mean to question. Yes. But it feels like this is stupid. I think we need to eradicate the commission of making war more difficult. Is it glider? Isn't that more obvious than parachutes? No, it's not. You do oh, it at night. Okay. And that, and the thing is about it is that yeah, you it, do what's it. What's the difference? You get to take your equipment with you. Uh, like you get to take equipment. Uh, everyone yeah, is yeah, 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 everyone yeah. is guaranteed to land in the same place. Yeah, you got you know, your you, gun, you got you a bunch of shit. It's yeah, very dead. It's very deadpool -y. Very much everyone dies. Yes. Very much Brad Pitt's about to be seen electrocuted. It's a good idea in theory. Uh, yeah, but it's not the rocketeer. It's also so many years ago. We're just coming out with this shit. It just wasn't ready. It rarely went how it was supposed to go. There's a in a Ken Burns documentary, The War. There is a very very long segment on how awful the gliders were how many, and how deadly they were, how much everyone hated them, how much everyone would argue, don't put me on the gliders, don't do it, don't do it, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, everyone dies. Work? No. How, but they the just 30, kept using it. Out of the 30, how many made it down? Okay, let's get into it. Please. Well, and by the way, gliders were also uh, constructed with corrugated iron floors so all the vomit could drain off. <laughs> because of how unstable how it was. Unstable, how scary it was, how unstable it was. Everyone threw up wow. on yeah. the way down because you could also barely you know, control it. You know what really helps me destroy yeah. a secret heavy water facility inside of a, a well-armed Nazi uh, hydration mm -hmm. plant um, is being super nauseous. Yeah. <laughs> And as it that usually, always gets me, gets me right to headspace. Be yeah. ready to go. And as it usually went, when it came to Operation Freshman, the gliders were the source of its failure. Uh, the first glider lost control and plummeted into the sea. The second crashed and instantly killed three out of the 17 men, further wounding six. Great. And of course, while they're trying to get their shit together, the Nazis immediately found them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the Nazis guarding Norsk Hydro were under secret orders to shoot all foreign saboteurs on site. But they were a little unsure of what to do with these guys because they're active duty military, but they're also saboteurs. 
So okay. they could be saboteurs, they, but they should probably be POWs. So the ranking commander called up his superior. And in an incredible coincidence, his superior was a guy named Wilhelm Keitel, who just happened to be uncle to Kitty Oppenheimer. That was Robert Oppenheimer's wife. Robert what? Oppenheimer was the father of the atomic bomb. Weird. Oh, weird. Yeah, really weird. It's fucking strange. Nevertheless, Keitel gave vague directions saying that you got orders. You should probably follow your orders. He didn't explicitly say execute prisoners okay. of war. Nazis are so good at like not like, I don't know, like they, they come up with euphemistic ways. Oh, yeah. Very good about that. Yeah, they, I mean, that's, it could be argued that concentration camps were a euphemistic way to exterminate the German people. Well, because the way they spoke about them, too, it's like everything was code because it's almost like they knew that everything they did was evil. Yeah, yes, because that's the, the thing. People. Yeah, they had to find some sort of like you like a different way of killing. But yeah. that was not quite so horrible for the people who had to do the killing. But it was bad. It was bad. Of course it was bad. Yeah, not fun. So the commander on site took the hint and shot each of the survivors in the head before dumping their bodies in a ditch. That was glider one. Ah. Meanwhile, the boys from the glider that had crashed into the sea had also been found by the Nazis. Out of those 15 commandos, six had died on impact. Okay. Four had been injured and five had come out of it unharmed. Good Lord, you could just see the whole time. she being like, what did we say <laughs> about yeah. the goddamn gliders? Yeah, not oh. good. But with this group, they did not have the luck of coming across a commander unsure of what to do. They had the bad luck to be captured by a German officer who was known, due to his brutality, as the Red Devil. Ooh. He ordered that the injured survivors from the first glider be murdered by morphine injection while the others watched. Which is, I mean, far crueler and slower yeah. than a simple shot to the head. To be honest, it's kind of dumb. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's about the cruelty. Cruelty is yeah. the point. As such, it's about the fun. I know, yes. <laughs> As such, after the first commando was killed by injection, the other three started resisting. So the Red Devil strangled one injured commando with his belt, killed another by stomping on his neck, and pushed a third down a flight of stairs before shooting him in the back. Yeah, wow. that's he, one fucking intense Nazi. Yeah. And he pulled down his pants, looked in the mirror at his dog-like dick, and said, that's why they call me the Red Devil. Now, <laughs> that's why I'm a Red Devil. <laughs> As for the uninjured survivors of Glider 1, they were sent to Oslo for interrogation with their hands tied behind their backs in barbed wire. Oof. And when they refused to talk, they were shot. Yep. In all, Ugh. every single man who went on Operation Freshman was killed. 30 dudes Jeez. just fucking dead. That's an O for... Uh, the nice thing is, though, I do think if we were kidnapped and forced to talk, we can fill hours. Oh, yeah, dude. I <laughs> like, mean, what do you want to talk about? Let's, we're like, let's get right into it. That's, yeah. what, that's how I'll say. Let's get right into let's it. And then we'll out. just do impressions for 45 minutes. <laughs> and we're like, no, no, we're getting to it. We're getting to yeah. it. And by targeting Norsk Hydro specifically, the Allies had shown their hand. The Nazis now knew that the Allies knew about their atomic program. Mm -hmm. So the Germans reinforced their defenses around the heavy water plant, making the next operation even more difficult. Because That's this was not the last time they'd go after Norsk Hydro. What they well. needed to do was Operation Sassy Maid and have <laughs> several men, our boys, right, mm -hmm. dress in their finest, right? Like, you know, we give them fake boobies. With the nice makeup on there. Some of more finer women, looking men. Why not just have no, women no, 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 no. We want the men in there. And what we do is we put a long wig and hair, French made outfit, have them go in, slowly but the surely spend, like a the but spend a couple of years. They like the maids. Oh. Go in there, slowly spend a couple of years building up trust, sucking some dick. That's... You teach him, honestly, because that bussy can be snapping. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, you don't need to necessarily need to have a pussy to have a fucking good time. Yeah, but at some point right? they're going to discover the cock and balls and the fake tits. No, no, but by then all. you've already been like, well, one hole is better than any other. <laughs> I tell you what, this hole is my home. <laughs> I guarantee you that happened during the war. You're hoping they're going to do the Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny thing <laughs> and what's opera doc. Yeah. That by the end of it, he's still going to be falling in love because he realized that he was in love no matter whether he had the... Yeah, because that bussy oh, be isn't snapping. That <laughs> nice. Isn't that how the crying game ended? I actually feel like there's more control over a butthole than there is a pussy. Uh, uh, you know we what? Debatable. Uh, we don't know. We just don't know. Debatable. It's another one of those secrets of World War II. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, by the way, the second raid on Norsk Hydro, which we'll get into next episode. It wasn't I think. Operation Sassy Maid? It wasn't Operation Sassy Maid. No, it's Sassy a great Maid, idea, no. though. Thank uh, you. It's one of the coolest missions in all of World War II. Mm. It's so fucking awesome. But we'll get into that uh, here 
in the next episode or two. All right. Now, by 1941, the British had figured out how to use the Norwegian heavy water. They were working on their own nuclear program, codenamed Tube Alloy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, cool. fine. I like yeah. it. I like it. Yeah. The Germans, meanwhile, were obviously also working on their own nuclear program with the Uranium Club. The Americans, however, having not yet entered World War II, still hadn't committed to a full nuclear weapons research program. Hmm. Although they'd been thinking about thinking about it for a while now. Take some time. You got to come around. You got to incept these people. You got to pre-debate before you debate. Mm -hmm. That's how it is. But by November of 1941... It was obvious to Roosevelt, if not the American people, that our inclusion in the war was inevitable. If anything, even if we stayed out of it till the end, FDR knew that if a man like Hitler had a weapon like an atomic bomb, we sure as hell better have a couple in our arsenal as well. Yeah. I'll bet my numb feet we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so President Roosevelt gave the go-ahead order to officially begin the scientific, engineering, and industrial production that would result in the atomic bomb, which slowly set in motion the Manhattan Project. Oh, my God. This turned out to be a prudent move because less than a month later, on December 7th, <gasps> 1941, oh. Japan would bomb Pearl Harbor. God. America was in the war, and it's with our entrance into the bloodiest conflict in history that we'll return for part two of the Manhattan Project. Holy wow, awesome. fucking but, shit. You know, now that I've thought about it, of course FDR wants highways. He wants roads. He wants roads. <laughs> you know how difficult it would be to be in a wheelchair with gravel roads oh, and no. mud roads? He said, that's why he kept saying, make the roads thinner. So he'd be the only one on it. <laughs> but, no, all uh, FDR wanted to do is just go between upstate New York, go from Hyde Park back down to Warm Springs, Georgia, yep. where he could be out in public with Ken all Burns. the rest of the no, polio. No, please don't. Right, we just, we, we love Ken Burns. You know, we, love Ken, we love you, Ken. You, know, you, know, you can Warm listen Springs, to the interview we did. Warm Springs, Georgia was really the only place where FDR could be himself <sighs> because when he was the a weapon. <laughs> Yes. Because <laughs> yes, once indeed. he was with fellow polio patients, he could truly let his legs dangle. Because you know what's the most? Because <laughs> you know what truly oh, is the it. most horrible force in the world? It's apathy. And that's, <laughs> true. that's what that creates. And this is a two hour mm. plus episode, two and a half hour episode. We just started. We just started. Like wait. America actually hasn't even started the Manhattan Project yet. This was the run up to the run up. But we're going to get her done. We're, we're going to get, get her done. Her done. We will. It's not, there's not going to be a nine episode series, yeah. but it'll be close. Next episode, we're going to get, we're going to introduce uh, Robert Oppenheimer. We're going to awesome. introduce one of the great American military characters of the 20th century, General Leslie Groves. We're mm. going to introduce Niels Bohr and his massive head. <laughs> He's a very <laughs> big head and made him unsafe. Uh, but yes, well, you know, maybe four or five. I don't know how many we're going to do here. Yeah, but I think we're going to do five. But this is, I, I it's, it's crazy because now we're getting to Operation Paperclip territory. It's weird how you like at the end of this we'll have caught up to the beginning of the MK Ultra series. I, I was which waiting, we'll go to the, but it's true. It's like it's weird how each one is now we're, we have covered this much history. Yeah, because I mean, really, the the attempt to keep the Nazis from uh, getting the atomic bomb that was partly the genesis of the OSS. Yes, you know, it's like it's so much, so much history of the 20th century comes from just this fear that the Nazis are going to have an atomic bomb. So it's one of the most consequential fears of, of Probably, fucking human history. Probably the reason why the American society, especially our leadership, has been so obsessed with casting a central villain for us again and again and again because they saw the productive power. You think the power. Nazis were uh, wrongly maligned? They, they, no, no, uh, not, no, not at all. No, it's no. He saw since, like, yeah, because since the Nazis, because of yeah. how inspired the Nazis made us. Yeah, well, it's the same thing that they tried doing with the Iraq war with Saddam Hussein. And of course, some people fell for it. A lot of people didn't. But that was the that was definitely the, the idea behind it. If we cast a big enough villain, then America will get behind this. You know my thoughts on Saddam. You can see me July 9th at Mike Drop Comedy. He's going to be talking Diego. all the, all Saddam Hussein <laughs> all the time. Anyway, check out. I got a couple of shows that people should go to. 716 Cobbs Comedy Club. <laughs> I love this show. This is a funny show to be like, and then you can check me out at Wise Guys. <laughs> After two and a uh, half hours. Vegas. I don't know. I have big... to sell these tickets or everyone's going to yell at me. No, you got you to come see him. Uh, He'll be please. funny. I'm not he worried heard, about it. No one thinks he heard what else am going to do. He said some stuff today. It was funny. You want yeah, more of that? I'm not insecure about my humor. <laughs> He's going to be funny. That, He's not going to be bad at it. It's more that I'm... You just, 
doing this to help out a friend. <laughs> um, all right, everyone. I can't wait to see you on the road. But thank you all so much for listening. Hope you're doing well. Keep on supporting all the shows here on the Last Podcast Network. Thanks so much for all the serious listeners. You guys have been so sweet on the phone calls. And do we have anything else? Yeah, That's, we're doing a lot. Yeah, No Dogs in Space season no three has begun. The first the series, monks. the monks. Thank you. And the first series is now out. It's a two parter. If you're waiting for the all whole right. thing to come out before you listen to it, it's now fully out. Parts one, parts two, and we're actually jumping a little bit ahead with the monks. This is like a big Germany month for uh, LPN because the monks are banned right. in Germany. So, so a lot of Cold War stuff, and then right. after that, we're going to get into a series that is rooted directly in post World War II Germany. So you you want to rebrand June from Pride Month to Germany Month? Okay, <laughs> great, great. That's going to work out great for the numbers. That's a really good. But it turns out in Germany, a lot of people were proud. I, I that know why. That's, 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 that's true. <laughs> All right, everyone, hail yourselves. Hail Satan. Hail game. Magustulations. Hail me. And also, uh, Cillian Murphy, uh, why don't you fucking dance for my calls? Yeah, he doesn't. Do you Answer. have his number? Yeah. Dude. I've just been yelling. <laughs> I've been driving down <laughs> Manhattan Beach. Yeah. I've been going and going like, so yeah. <laughs> why so serious? You, that's not him. Why he didn't so do serious? the Joker. No, I want him to do it for me. But then he be wasn't like, that character. I'd be he cool, was not even the right movie. No, I'd be he like, was you do the, do the, the other guy's line. That. Do the better line. No, do the better line by the you other guy. You are never going to meet him. I've been here six months and I've still only seen Steven Root when, it comes, to, when it comes to celebrities. And that's a good one. That's a real good one. That you is go a good out, one. You got to go out to eat more. I and saw the that's gal- the thing. I saw him when I was out to eat. Yep. I saw the gal at Queen's Gambit. Honestly, we'll go to Smokehouse. We'll go 10 times, seven times we'll see somebody. Kissel saw Anna Taylor Joy, and he didn't even scare her at all. No, I didn't yeah. say anything. <laughs> all right, heal yourselves, bye. <laughs> this show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com.